Hello, hello everyone. It's me, Chapman on a coffee. And, uh, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while since I, uh, did a video for CK3, but I did promise that I would, uh, get this sorted out. It, I, it just was actually supposed to go up about a week ago. Probably a bit longer than that, actually, but, um, uh, some things happened, I had a couple of busy weekends, and on top of that, uh, Baldur's Gate 3 came out, which I was actually supposed to be playing today, but it just won't launch, so, uh, thanks, Laren. Anyway, um, I want to do this as a conclusion to the Bohemia World Conquest game for CK3. Um... It's been a while since I actually played it. It's been a couple of months now since I, I finished that run. And just thinking back on it, I'm going to try to summarize some of the good parts of the run, some of the bad parts of the run, some general tips for CK3 in general. And yeah. Ignore that it says Roman Empire, if you saw the last episode of the series then you'll know that we did actually do this entirely without flipping into the Roman Empire. Not that I think the Roman Empire CB is particularly good. Um, yeah, so 1368 AD. We start out as a uh, the Slavic, Slavianskan faith as a count of Hradek, right? So, OPM count, vassal of Bohemia, who's on the border of the HRE, or, well, East Rank here anyway. 867 start, right? Um, we have all the tech, we've got, well, we own everything. Took a while to conquer some places, but I thought we we might be a bit strapped for time by the end of this run, but it was really easy by the end of it. So let's talk about some of the... Uh, I never know which to do first. I always feel like if I start with the good stuff, then I'll just be, it'll just be a non-stop tirade towards the end, but I suppose that's the important thing. So let's start with the good stuff. Um, CK3 is very good for the first say 200 300 years of the game um, when you're not really powerful um, if you focus heavily on role playing each character out that is to say you don't try to play super optimally with each character you just try to take what makes sense for their personality and you try to you play to that style or even um, actually creating a crusader state um, these are all pretty reasonable solutions to the problem I had, um, but I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so yeah, the first uh, the first half of the game is enjoyable, very enjoyable. Uh, building up a kingdom, playing politics, uh, trying to push claims where you can, managing a family. First half of the game is very enjoyable. Um, oh, they added a decision button. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that's how I've played for a while. I've been waiting for the mods to update. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Uh, armies are a lot more balanced in the early game as well. So it makes warfare a little bit more um, deadly. Uh, tactical. So yeah. The first half of the game. Positive experience. When you start moving into the period where you have two empires, say about two empires, under your, um, or two empire titles, like, as your main crowns, that's when the game starts to lose meaning, um, and it becomes a classic paradox, map painting fest, and... The easiest way to showcase this, I mean, many of you will have already seen it in the previous, uh, well, in the run itself. But I will showcase some of the things that completely trivialize the game. I know everybody's seen those videos about 
OMG, insert smiley emoji, Crusader Kings 3 is totally broken, golden obligations, it's the most powerful thing ever, blah blah blah. That That's a load of clickbaity shit. Um, if you're actually interested in playing Paradox games, um, you'll know that that kind of stuff is, is that's like tip of the iceberg, right? The most powerful stuff in CK3, for those of you that are curious, um, it's pretty simple really. We go into military here. Um, we click this little banner down here. You can have multiple rally points. Um, you rally your troops, right? So if I put a rally flag down here in Hertfordshire, um, I can raise all my troops. So I click raise all. It raises all of my men at arms and my knights and my siege weapons immediately and they start rallying now it's going to take um 137 days to gather up my 32,000 levy right it's gonna take a you know four months um five almost five months to gather up all the troops to go and fight someone which is way too long way too long all you have to do is hold control and right click. All right, that stops the gathering. Now, I at first didn't know that trick. I had to use the split off new army. You just move everyone into the next army. Uh, I picked up the trick pretty quickly after that. Um, but regardless, that, that now gives you full control of these guys. Now these guys, I'm not doing a North Korea strat. I have all the vassals, you know, and I've had them the entire game. We, play, we played this run as paradox intended right i don't even have my full domain limit with all the tech i just have nine domain holdings i've got these holdings over here i took rome as well for the for some you know because rome's got bonuses but i had eight holdings right i had eight holdings for the majority of the game or not even that even six um most of them are baronies which are basically small castles and just by utilizing the um the blacksmiths you know, I've got about how many of those? Six of them. I've got some um, barracks, training grounds. Got the blacksmith guild. Um, these units, even with just what's intended, have 105 attack value and 78 toughness. The pikemen especially have 92 attack and 87 toughness with good terrain effects. Not that terrain matters when your numbers are these inflated. But they have it. Uh, these guys, if you watch the final video of the, well, the final video aside from this one, of the run, they just, they melt everything. You always have like a 20, 20 plus martial commander because you're a really big empire and somebody's going to have 20 martial. Um, but uh, your armies will just, they'll walk over people, right? So this, this, this army of 12k can, it was slapping 60,000 Abbasid troops with, without breaking a sweat. Um, lose maybe 2,000 men and 1,500 of them replenish after the fight anyway. So how is that OP? That, that's, clearly, that's clearly how the game intended, right? I mean, I haven't, these numbers don't look different from my actual run, which means they haven't patched them. So this is clearly the intended late game numbers of troops so why is this op well it's op for a few reasons right so i disband the troops right now when i raise new troops they take four months to gather because of the levee i hold control i right click the army is moving all right let's uh let's go and put this flag over in india and uh, raise the troops. So as you can see, I can just teleport 12,000 men across the map. So basically distance doesn't matter. You will have noticed me doing this as we played in the later stages of the campaign. I would literally just go, oh, we're going to go fight this nation up in Russia. Bam, slap the flag down, raise the troops, go and fight them. Right, they're all dead, disband the army. Then I'm going to go and move this over here. I'm going to go fight some Mongo Mongolian nations next. Raise the troops over here, move them around, fight them. Oh, we had a rebellion with all our lords. Don't worry about that. I'll just bring that flag over here into England. We'll fast siege a bunch of places in England. 
you get the picture. It's it's freaking overpowered, right? It's it's stupid. It's stupid, but it's optimal, right? And this is probably the most broken thing about CK3 is the ability to. Uh, and you know, if if I was to say, oh well, scaling the unit stats is the most broken th thing because you can't use your men at arms in a in a way where you teleport them and just ignore your enemy well you don't ignore your enemy's armies but they you know that they can't beat you because the stats are so inflated from these buildings well yes but this is clearly intended right the the build the, the strength of the units is clearly intended because they haven't they haven't scaled back the numbers and it's not like I'm cheesing I'm not cheesing the game like this is this is absolutely just how they expect you to play CK3, right? I have some castles, I put buildings in them, I level the buildings up, like, I haven't done anything weird. I have the tech, but it's not like any of the tech is particularly, like, special or overpowered, it's just what it is. So, totally intended army stats, uh, which means later in the game, they just walk all over the AI, um, and I would in, I will I will want to talk about the AI in general um, because honestly I, I I get it CK3 excels uh, Crusader Kings excels as a role playing title primarily with the option of being a map painter. Right, standard paradox map painting. Right. Now, I personally love map painting, so you must excuse me for that. Is my my chosen focus whenever I play games like this? It is uh, stacking modifiers, breaking game mechanics, and map painting. But that's what I enjoy. So, for those of you that like to do this as well, I thought I'd try and give you some tips. Um, and yeah, first biggest. Major thing is, as you get later into the game, teleporting a stack of unkillable men-at-arms around can win you each and every single war at practically no effort or cost to yourself. And, yeah. The second most broken thing is the fact that, if I take a look at um, any vassal in my court, as you can see, I have no crown authority. That that is intentional for the direct vassal opinion. Uh, let's look at any of these bastards. King King Jan of Hellas. Sky has a minus eighty two from offensive wars because I don't have warmonger. I have pursuit of power, so that causes some issues. <laughs> But I also have uh, minus 50, you can see down there, minus 50 from Broke Truce, right? Now in the final episode you will have seen me just continuously truce break um, the last couple of AI nations. Mostly because I couldn't be bothered to wait. I could have waited and I still would have been able to do it in the uh, time limit that the game provides you. But I, I just couldn't be bothered to wait. So, you can truce break, right? There's no stability in CK3. There's just vassal opinion. That's it. And vassal opinion doesn't matter, right? As you can see here, the dude has got minus, like, 82 from offensive wars, and a minus 50 from broken truce, and a minus 15 from being a murderer. You know, like, nobody cares. Nobody cares, and the people that do care, oh, they they want to they want to make a faction. They they want to make a faction. There you go, independence from leech. So it's, all these guys want want to fire off. Now I, I could let them fire off, and then I'll just teleport my men at arms around and kick the shell. And like it, it it doesn't matter. And given the way war score works, I only need to teleport my army around and quick siege like. You know, one kingdom down, and then I can I can just white piece out the faction, and then they can't form it for another few years, right? And the offensive wars malice disappears on ruler death. The broken truce will disappear in 
two years, right? I think it's like a five year limit or something. I don't really know, but it, it's going to disappear in two years and then they won't even want a faction because most of them won't be angry at me. I can also just go throw a bunch of money at them. I can just send gift to the majority of these people and plus 84 opinion because this one, this one I'm working up to is the most overpowered lifestyle tree in the game. Now, if you, you'll see other people, they go, oh yeah, but I can make tons of money on stewardship. Look how amazing my my golden obligations is. Who cares, right? Like, I, I have 20,000 gold and I make 55 a month. I can just ransom 5 million prisoners. I don't have any right now. I release them all before I finish. Uh, I finished the run, but I had like three three hundred prisoners. I could just ransom them all for fucking obscene amounts of money, right? It's it, it, stewardship is useful for the early game when you don't have much cash, right? That's the only thing it's good for for the first like one hundred years of the game. Once you've built buildings, and this is what I recommend you do in the early game, build just just focus entirely on don't hit your well don't don't even hit your um your domain cap just make money that's all that's all you should do is make money and build buildings in your ducal capital that you own right now the trick is is with partition which is what you'll have to deal with you will lose all of your other titles right you'll lose your other county titles to your other sons. Now a lot of people are like, oh I'll just murder all my other sons. Don't bother. There's no point. The more land your dynasty owns, the better, because they can make for useful allies when expanding. As long as they're a title lower than you, even if they're not as high or lower than you, it's still pretty handy to have them around. The best thing to do, now obviously it is nice if you can just engineer a situation where you don't have any heirs, um, except one. Um, who will get everything that that is very helpful yep D don't get me wrong but a more useful one is to simply select your realm capital in a state or province uh, where there's multiple free building slots i.e prague right prague has its bishopric and its city and that's it it has three free slots two of which are on farmland which allows the uh blacksmiths uh, the regimental camp uh regimental grounds line of building which gives uh, men at arms maintenance and heavy infantry and spear damage and toughness right it also allows manor houses which are the highest base tax building in the game so you combine these together and these make really good money like more than prague right they make really good money for a barony now, how does this work? Well, when you partition, you pass out equivalent titles to all of your heirs, with the main titles going to your primary heir. Baronies that you control inside of the county or the realm capital, right? So this is a county capital. If I move the realm capital here, um, yeah, sure. That, that's fine. Um, baronies within the realm capital's province are maintained upon partition succession. So one of the key things you'll want to do is try to pick a county where there are free slots. It's a good county. It's got plenty of free slots. So even something as, as simple as taking London, right? You've got two barony slots on farmlands, which is more than enough to upkeep quite a powerful army in the early game. And you also get the special building, the Tower of London, which gives a 5% holding tax as a dev growth bonus, a huge fort level, and a bunch of dread gain for your entire realm. Right, that's another thing that we'll get to in just a second. Right. But there are plenty of examples of powerful, large provinces, um, 
there's uh, Pagan's opening province, which has these three here, which also has a, sp a spot for the Ananda Temple, which gives three tax, and also has three Grassland provinces to build new baronies on. New baronies, of course, will get uh, given down to you. Uh, there's plenty of other examples, you just got to go and look for them, okay? Uh, Rome is mostly well developed at the start of the game, so you might not be able to put much more else uh, down. So I wouldn't worry too much about Rome, but there are other examples in Italy, there's examples in Germany. There is always, and normally they tend to be historical counties, there's always a county in the 867 and probably the 1066 start, though I would err uh, more on the side of, 10, of 867. Um, that will have plenty of free slots open, you just make it your realm capital, Bob's your uncle, slap a bunch of baronies down there, partition succession, you can completely ignore for the rest of the game, right? You could stay partitioned, I, I could have stayed partition succession, I mean I can't because I have too many empire titles, but it, it, realistically you could just stay partition succession, right? Okay, so... Next thing that's busted. Um, but I was talking about lifestyles. I, I kind of just skipped the point because, yeah. I'm going to be rambling a lot in this, but it's hopefully you guys understand it is a, it's a process by which I go through all of the things that I recall being incredibly overpowered. So, lifestyles. Uh, yeah, stewardship, good early on. You need it to build buildings, get those baronies up. But that's it. Past the early game, stewardship is the most useless perk uh, tree in the game. It's I, I sometimes I I like going for it's my domain because you can extort subjects to generate some dread. But there's better ways to generate dread, i.e., mass executing people in your prisons. Um, intrigue. Intrigue is um, the basement dweller lifestyle tree. It's it's for players that want to sleep with their sisters or they want to. Uh, throw their rivals in jail after they kidnap them from some far off kingdom. Um, intrigue is completely useless as a tree. Uh, I wouldn't really bother with it. I mean, maybe you flip to Skullduggery to get um, uh, Digging for Dirt, Fabricate Hooks, that can be handy. If you're a vassal, Intrigue's nice to fabricate hooks to modify your feudal contract, but aside from that, it's kind of eh. Yeah, I guess you can fabricate hooks with golden obligations to make more money. That's something you can do. Um, if you're really desperate for cash, if you're like in the HRE, I guess that's kind of a good idea, but uh, generally speaking, the majority of this tree is used. Sometimes I'll drip it. Uh, I'll drip or dip into this tree to grab the 30% facility if I really need a bunch of airs. Um, uh, if you've got a character that's got a bunch of perks in Intrigue, just reset them and put them all in Torturer, because that at least gives you Dread. Um, which is actually a useful stat, but like the majority of like things in Intrigue are not that useful. Right. Next one, Marshall. Marshall has some things that you want, particularly so in the early game. In the early game, chivalry is incredibly important. Uh, the 75% knight effectiveness, uh, the plus four extra knights, the plus five advantage and less friendly casualties. Gallon is probably single-handedly the best early game uh, tree for carving any kind of empire, right? Because this directly makes your army more powerful without relying on men at arms, where men at arms come down more into strategist, which is not worth going into early on in the game when you don't have many uh, men at arms. Exception being to chiefdoms, because tribal nations can get lots of men at arms, but I'd still recommend just going down Gallant. Uh, secondarily, we've got Bellum Justum, half price for CBs. Very good. It's it's worth picking it up all the time, um, unless you have a prestige income of uh, seventeen a month. Like I don't have that much party, but you know, seventeen prestige a month makes 
declaring most claim wars an absolute joke. Um, you these numbers look like incredibly high. You could do the North Korea strategy and get even higher. I'm just trying to showcase that you don't need to do anything quite so exploitative of the AI as it currently functions to do a WC. You you don't need to do that. Um, CK3 is. It's fairly easy as it is. So, Marshall, Bellum just a good pickup. Gallon, the right side tree. Um, don't ignore the left side of the Gallant tree either. Promising prospects is actually really handy for getting alliances. If you're a Duke and you have promising prospects, you will be able to marry princesses of kingdoms. Possibly even an empress um, or a female heir uh, to a, an empire like the Byzantine Empire. Because the plus 50 marriage acceptance, if you combine that with picking up... Um, better not click that button or it will crash. Uh, but if you pick up the desirable match, the first part of glory, which is a really good tree. I'll come to these a bit later. But desirable match, uh, 30 marriage acceptance, that's plus 80 um, which means that it completely removes the uh, of lower rank and actually gives you a bonus uh, to marrying people of a higher rank. So if you've got desirable traits or you're particularly powerful or high opinion, they're quite likely to accept that, which can get you some really powerful allies early on in the game, which is when it matters the most. So don't discount... Um, the promising prospects. It's not the most useful perk, but it has its niche uses that does make it like, you know, I might as well mention it. Um, so, all right, finally, you've got Serve the Crown, Natural Dread, Control Growth. Now, the Control Growth is a flat value, not a percentage, which is why this one is so important. Um, Serve the Crown is basically, uh, it does the purpose of telling your marshal uh, to increase control. It basically has the same purpose, um, except it does it passively. So that is an incredibly good perk. If you're conquering any kind of significant amount of land, and you intend to keep it for yourself, at least until the death of your ruler, you need Surf the Crown. And the Natural Dread is helpful. Um, aside from that, there's not a huge amount of value in this tree, if I'm being... <sighs> perfectly honest. Sorry, I'm a little bit drowsy today. Um, so yeah, not a huge amount. I mean, even in Strategist, it's not... I'm not that excited by Strategist. I guess the extra movement speed with Organized March it also gives extra screen value, but who cares about screen value? That's if you're running away, so you don't even want to consider it. But yeah, the movement speed in Bellum Justum is about it. So you've got like these two, this one, and like this six also or seven or nine if you go for promising prospects but so like marshall has a pretty decent amount of the tree that you want to take i mean stewardship you're looking at uh golden obligations my domain here gale detailed ledgers maybe if you really need cash but again just early game um administrator claim throne can be really good if you're in a situation to abuse that um aside from that I mean, likable can be handy, but that's about it. So you've got like these three, and then architect is architect's actually pretty relevant to go and grab if you really want um, centralization. It's a handy one. Uh, making buildings cheaper or just making more cash. Though this isn't actually that good for cash. This is much better for cash. Um, taxman is okay because he gives collect tax loss effectiveness, but really you want to go for these three. So, not nearly as much investment. Um, it's kind of situational which one you go for, um, depending on what you're doing in your current playthrough. Of uh... <laughs> sorry, I've got a letter. Didn't realize I had. I'll open that later. Anyway, so uh, yeah, that's um. That's situational, situational. Intrigue, again, Intrigue's another sort of very situational one. Um, that you only really go down 
intrigue if you've got a very specific thing you have to do and normally you can flip out of it pretty quickly um next i want to talk about learning learning is the next strongest thing um a, lo a lot of people go on about know thyself being really powerful i'm not seeing it uh yeah it's handy that you know your death is one year away but if you're going down medicine focus chances are you're just trying to prolong your life to get something done and either you get that thing done or you don't and if you don't then know thyself didn't help and if you did then know thyself wouldn't help so shrug uh it's kind of handy if you want to abuse um, sending gifts to your heir, because there's no cooldown on sending gifts to the uh, player heir there, so I can just send him as much gold as I want, and when he comes to power, he'll have a fucking huge amount of money, right? But I'm pretty sure they inherit some of it anyway, so what does it matter? But yeah, you can use that in conjunction with Know Thyself, if you need to um i mean this is a really good perk don't get me wrong this is really good and with the medium health boost here and the medium health boost here your character will live till they're about 80 most of the time um but uh the medicine focus isn't that great i think anatomical studies is handy that's that's an okay one to pick up maybe the stress gain if you've got a character who has a perk that gives them more stress uh like um i'm trying to remember uh there's some it's i think it's like uh oh god i can't remember what it is it's been a while since i played but say say um you are uh, just, I think one of these people was just, or zealous and you get faith from messing around with other religions and things. Uh, if you've got a trait that it effect increases, like, like just the assassinating people is going to cause you stress, it can be useful to take that perk to uh, mitigate that. But that's, that's, again, that's a bit of a situational thing. So, so far, most of the perks have been situational or timed to a specific stage of the game. Uh, same goes for theologian. Uh, if you're going down uh, profit, uh, or just try to get more piety to reform the faith, that's again that's a specific stage of the game kind of lifestyle perk that's only really useful for, well, that. Um, and then you've also got apostate. Same deal. Useful for specific things. However, however, Zealous Proselytizer, convert faith in county progress speed and religious icon, convert faith in county, the time it takes to convert is no longer increased if that faith is a higher fervor than your faith. These two perks are useful practically throughout the entire game, though when you hit a certain critical mass, you'll no longer care about converting provinces because you're just going to keep on conquering more land. As you can see, the faith looks like a freaking mess in my game. That's because I don't really care. Um, you'll get to a point where you're not bothered what faith your people follow, only that they follow a faith, which they have to because mechanically the game forces them to follow a faith. So what I just said is kind of points out the redundancy of, of the system. Um, it doesn't matter what faith people follow once you get late enough into the game. And I'll go into a little bit. This is going to be a fairly long video in case you can tell. But it's going to include all the good stuff that you want to hear about Crusader Kings and how you can abuse the crap out of it. Or just how the game is abusable. Uh, it's not, or not even abusable, just how the game is designed. Because it's not like I'm trying to exploit it, it's just, this is how the game is designed, so. Eventually, you don't care about even converting provinces, that's not even a concern. Um, maybe converting the provinces that you personally hold, those counties, that's important to convert, so that can sometimes be a relevant perk to do that, but, yeah, even then, you'll you'll give up on that eventually. Right, so we're moving on to the actual relevant perks throughout the entire game. Uh, yeah, I've gone through three and a half uh, perk trees and 
we haven't got to the relevant at all stages of the game one. What you should be realising now is that the majority of perks in the game are niche and situational. You should be jumping in and out of different uh, groups all the time. Depending on what you need at the time. Now some of them are more relevant for a longer period of time. Uh, Avarice is a little bit more relevant for a longer period of the game. Intrigue is sort of... This be can become useful at different stages. Marshall kind of falls out unless you're crouching on Bellum Tristam or Serve the Crown or something. So, yeah. Uh, learning will crop up a lot more in the early to mid game, depending on what you're trying to do in your particular um, run. Uh, particularly... Pedagogy, your wards can get additional skills and can become your friends, so it's an easy way to be to befriend your heirs and also to get them to acquire some extra skill points. A pretty handy thing. They'll get about two, three extra skill points. Nothing crazy, but it's nice. And I think it also increases the chance of them getting a higher learning perk. Or, or uh, like a higher level of education so this is your education trait i think it gives them a higher chance for that but i honestly don't remember um it but they do get extra skills which is nice so pedagogy is actually kind of handy um open-minded is also a pretty good one for the different culture opinion plus 15 and improve negative culture opinion or ignore negative culture opinion yes so open-minded is actually really helpful as you start to expand outside of your natural cultural borders which tends to be your first empire that's when your culture will start to become less homogenous and you'll start to pick up courtiers claimants knights of all sorts of cultures as well as having vassals who are different cultures as well so open-minded can be really useful to kind of prop up your relations with vassals as you get bigger if that's a real concern um though apostate again this is a very specific uh, trait, though the different faith opinion can also be very helpful. Say you're playing in Spain and you conquer a bunch of the Islamic nations in southern Spain. Um, as you're converting them, you can take apostate and open minded, which you have to take open minded to get apostate. And all of the different culture, different faith characters in southern Spain will be plus 30 relations with your current king, which is kind of handy. So they can be relevant, uh, but it's more for a, uh, it's more, it's still a bit more niche because of the faith conversion cost, but, uh, pie cost, but it's, it's still, this is, this is more relevant throughout the game. Um, then we have scientific control or cultural fascination progress is one of the few ways to increase your cultural fascination, uh, which is basically how tech works in the game. Um. And it does take a while. Uh, oh, they changed the uh, icons for this, I think. They look nice. Anyway, um, yeah, it's... Sorry, give me one second. Ah, right back. Um... It's funny, I'm acting like this is a live video, but it's not. It's just me on uh, YouTube. Anyway, cultural fascination. Uh, that perk is about one of the only ways to get an increased speed of it, aside from deving, uh, getting more de uh, development in your counties of your culture. Uh, but that's okay, because you can always just flip out cultures as and when you want. Um, ha though, that that is a big one. It's a big one. Next, we've got increased dev in county efficiency and also, well, I guess learning per level devotion. But if you want to really push your cultural fascination, you'll want these two. So that's, there's that, I suppose. And then scholarly circles gives learning, which can be useful for all sorts of different reasons. 20% um, of counselors' primary skills are added to your own. Now, that's just good. Right, this is just good. If you have a particularly good set of counsellors that are all quite young and you expect them to last quite a long time, 
um, and you're planning on going down one or both of these routes anyway. I mean, Scarlet's probably one of the better trees in the game. Learn on the job becomes very good. This can be a plus. Uh, say you have a counselor with. Uh, when I talk about good counselors, I'm talking counselors with like a plus 20 in their stats, right? Now I've got a plus 30 here on my chancellor so if i had that perk he'd be giving me plus six to my diplomacy which is actually a really big thing for general opinion um it would give me a, an extra plus three i believe to my general opinion which doesn't again doesn't sound like much but is actually really handy um as well as just making all of my diplomacy based stuff more effective but if you've got a, a council which you have uh high control over and about, uh, they all have about 20 in all their skills. They're going to give about plus 4 to all of your stats. Now, it's not the best way to increase your skills. But as I said, Scholar is one of the better perk trees in the game. And that's for the next thing on the tree. Sanctioned loopholes. You can use the buy claim interaction. You just have to right click on any bastard. Once you have buy claim, you right click on anybody you don't currently own as a direct vassal you right click on them you click buy claim you pay piety and you acquire claims instantaneously instant claims just like that just bam spend some piety get some claims go on a, a pilgrimage to jerusalem you just acquired yourself a couple of extra counties for that particular character or at least some claims on some of those counties right now that might not seem that great right but how many times have you had like a two learning bishop of your faith which you can't replace and you try and get them to fabricate claim and it's going to take five years, right? And also they're, they're going to get discovered, they're going to cause bad events to happen and they're not going to be able to put a claim on an entire county or no, an entire duchy, sorry, for you. So, and that's happened multiple times in this run where I've had absolutely useless bishops. Now I have mostly been doing holy war cbs and things like that but um if you're say playing in the heartland of europe like you're playing in in france in the hre in italy in england in the 1066 start or you just managed to kick the uh the vikings out if you're playing in this heart or even in the byzantine empire if you're playing in a or or as the abbasids right if you're playing in the abbasid caliphate or or in india uh, if you're attacking your own faith by claim interaction is really good really good because what else are you using your piety for um these are currencies right piety and prestige are no longer point scoring they are currencies you need to spend them, right? Otherwise, they don't do anything. So things like buy claim uh, gives you an alternate uh, usage for your piety currency. I am fine. I I did find it a bit weird that they turned them into like important. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a bit sniffly today. A bit of a cold coming on, I think. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I found it a bit weird they turned them into currencies, but it is what it is. Anyway, so that's Scholar. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're going to take sanctioned loopholes, you might as well grab the perk as well, because it does give you a dev growth, and it gives you a bonus to your schemes, which it can be kind of handy, so, you know. As well as the highest learning bonus in the game, which is plus five, which learning affects your uh, fascination progress and uh, piety. Um, yeah, piety reduces prestige costs to increase crown authority, and other characters are more likely to accept when you demand conversion. Uh, doesn't actively uh, increase whatever else it was that I said it did, but yeah, ignore that. Alright, most important lifestyles in the game are found here. Under diplomacy, diplomacy is the um, the Chad lifestyle tree, if you want to put it in those terms. 
of all other lifestyle trees. This is the creme de la creme. This is the OP, right? Diplomacy. Diplomacy is the most powerful thing in CK3, okay? Let's start with the diplomacy. Let's let's start by looking at the perks, shall we, a little bit. So you get some piety. Yeah, you get some piety with learning. That's that's cool. Useful if you need it. Uh, intrigue if you want to do a bunch of schemes. Sure. But honestly, you just need a loyal spy master who's going to keep you safe. And then you don't need intrigue as a stat. Stewardship gives you domain limit and taxes. If you find you're running a bit low on stewardship, just marry someone that you can set to stewardship. Or yeah. another thing, uh, you know, you can assist ruler, but you know, if you want, if you're not bothered about doing the whole gene breeding and a uh, uh, master race, which honestly I, I wouldn't care about it if I were you. As, I mean, you can for memes, but if you're talking about optimization, optimally, it's Sure, early on, it's quite a nice idea to try and get some, like, genius characters going. But, you know, when you get later into the game, you don't really care who, who you're, who's coming to the throne. So, you'll marry people literally just for the highest stat. When you go to marry people, you'll be like, oh, let's marry a wife. Like, you'll see my wives here. I've got a 24 diplomacy one. I've got a 20 diplo uh, 22 intrigue one. And, um, I, I don't, I think I married her for an alliance, but whatever, um... You'll search by spouses and go, oh, my stewardship is a bit low. Better just marry this 21-year-old for her stewardship score, right? We're a meritocratic society here. We marry based on uh, based on skills. So you just marry a wife that you need for the stats that you want, and you just uh, set them to to give those stats. Um, or husband, you know, it, it doesn't matter. You, you get the picture. You, they just give you stats, right? Uh, which we'll come back into that later on, but... Yeah, so stewardship just gives taxes, which is fine and domain limit, but honestly, if you've got domain limit, as long as you're not over your domain limit, then it's the, the bonus taxes is whatever. Um, Marshall's probably the only one that's rele like really relevant, but only if you're commanding the armies personally, which you won't need to do um, to actually win your battles. It, it, sometimes, if you've got a king that's good at it, fair enough, but, you know, don't worry about it if you've got a king like the first character of this particular run i needed to be a good fighter and he sucked at marshall but i still did it he still led the armies and i still gave him the chivalry perks and he ended up being okay because that's what the chivalry perks do they make you they make the most useless fighter into being okay so and if you're a good fighter they make you into excellent but um you can totally function with just what you have Diplomacy, though. Monthly prestige. Now, prestige is involved with claiming titles uh, or fighting claimant wars, which is arguably the most expensive CBs in the game. Increased effectiveness of diplomacy schemes, such as befriending and swaying. Swaying is something you'll be doing a lot of with your vassals, as you... Uh, I always had a sway scheme running basically the entire game as soon as I was any body of importance as soon as you have vassals that can break off and do independence factions you will be swaying people for the rest of the game or just swaying people in your court so increasing the effectiveness of diplomacy schemes is just good uh, and general opinion now general opinion matters more the earlier on in the game you are when you get later into the game you get like a massive plethora of Extra buffs. I'll look at a vassal because it's slightly more um, relevant. Um, so uh, we've got uh, gen generous liege. I think because I have the generous thing. Autonomous vassals. Uh, uh, St Stammer, Herzogtum, knighthood, noblesse oblige. These are all cultural perks, um, which I highly recommend you go and grab. Um, same dynasty, close bonds, uh, I've got Pilgrim, Living Legend from our Prestige, which is easy to get, uh, plus personal diplomacy of plus 8, I only have like 16 diplomacy, I could pump that number up to 30 without even thinking about it, um, righteousness, you know, like, there's there's a bunch of things that boost opinion, and I could check any of my vassals and it would be, it would be the same story, right? But early on in the game, you don't have all those modifiers. You don't have the um, the mass of uh, cultural modifiers like um, 
uh, where is it? It's in the high medieval. A senioralism? No, it's not. Is that is that it? No, it's not that one. It's um, peerage, peerage, right? Yeah, it, f cultures in Francia, direct vassal opinion. Uh, peerage, stemma Herzogtum, uh, which is going to give extra direct vassal opinion. Um, apparently, I've lost access to some of these perks that I actually had in the run. I'm sure I had Gilman, but um, yeah, I definitely went and got. Did I go and get Gilman, or did I go get something else? I'm I'm sh I'm sure I had some of these. Anyway, or was it Muladi? I'm pretty sure it was like Muladi or something. They they might have changed. I'm not really sure, but I, either way, we had we had some cultural innovations that we no longer have um, that gave opinion to vassals. But you know, you can and and even just the tech, the tech itself, not just the um, the culturally specific text, but things like noblesse oblige and stuff gives direct vassal opinion. So later on, it's much easier to acquire higher numbers of um, direct uh, vassal opinion and also just a general opinion as well, um, particularly in your dynasty tree. So, yeah, not something you need to concern yourself with a huge amount. Uh, later in the game, but early on in the game, general opinion definitely helps. So, diplomacy is good for that. Uh, th those are just the stats, though. So let's talk about why diplomacy matters so much, especially as a chieftain where you want high prestige. You can get some extra prestige per month for Majesty focus. Though raiding is still a lot better for that. Um, do not neglect it. Uh, Majesty focus is a perfectly acceptable way of acquiring some additional prestige. So, yeah, don't don't just uh, discount that. Anyway. Right. Opinion gain from send gift 100%. Now, obviously, early on in the game, sending gifts is, you know, it's expensive. But 100% opinion gain? Now, say someone is, a, is greedy. They have the trait greedy. Um, or, yeah, the... the you know, the trait. I don't know if that's the appropriate term for them. Personality trait, yeah, yeah, So if, if they have greedy, they'll get a massive increase to opinion if you send them a gift. What about if that opinion was plus 100%? Well, that's why I'm able to go to uh, vassals in my realm, like this guy. Uh, this guy is, you know, he's not greedy or anything. He's gluttonous. Maybe that helps. Um, but I can, um, he's got minus 100 opinion. I can send him a gift. And he'll increase his opinion by 97. Bam, he's now more or less loyal, right? He's not loyal, but you get the opinion. Like, I can go up to these, like, incredibly disloyal characters and, and get them, you know, more or less on side, you know? And it costs me a little bit of gold. Like, this guy's at minus 12. Bam, he's now incredibly loyal. Uh, this guy is 22. Uh, 115 opinion. Bam. Man is now my best friend, right? The diplomacy perk, thoughtful, is really, really good, right? Once you've got a lot of cash under your belt, you can ransom prisoners for a ton of gold because you're an empire, uh, you're an emperor, and it is based on rank. So if I'm an emperor and I capture another emperor, it's worth more than if I'm a count and I capture an emperor. Uh, it might be to do with your prestige rank, I don't know, but either way. Uh, you can make tons of money out of ransoming people. So, make him cash. And also, if you follow the tactic of building your... Starting the game and just focusing on building up a power base to avoid partition succession. So, you have a large power base of baronies that make you a good amount of gold. Then, it's you can send gifts. And you can use those to acquire um, alliances. If you go down another perk in the diplomacy tree that I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, or marriages... Um, also very handy, uh, or just getting people to join wars that otherwise they wouldn't, uh, or, you know, uh, leaving factions, those are the main ones. So, thoughtful, incredibly powerful. Uh, Ducal Conquest, title creation cost goes down, which is, can be handy, but you're also able to use Ducal Conquest CB, so rather than using the Conquest CB, which costs you flat prestige to declare war for neighbouring territory, you do have to unlock this, 
um, you can now do Ducal Conquest, which allows you to declare war for an entire duchy. Now, it does cost a lot of prestige, but if you can't get any other way of getting a claim, and or you can't be bothered to wait for your crappy to learning bishop to create uh, county claims and push them, you can grab this perk and get yourself a nice Ducal Conquest. Um, but that's not really the best thing about this. The best thing about it is forced vassalization, which allows you to declare war and force vassalize anyone of a lower rank on your border. Which, as an emperor, allows you to force vassalize just about everyone in the game. And you might be thinking, but I don't get the land for myself. Well, at some point in the game, you already have all the land you want, which means that this just lets you put more people in your empire, and they can just suck it up, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, Force Vassalage is the probably the most powerful CB in the game, bar maybe Mongolian Conquest, um, or Horde Con Conquest, whatever it is. So yeah, um, Force Vassal is really, really powerful. Right, next we have Adaptive Traditions, Foreign Affairs Effectiveness. This is for gaining um, sort of passive prestige gain with your Chancellor. Um, you can sometimes get some good events with it, but yeah, who cares about that? Uh, but it does lead to this. Shorter truces and no prestige penalty for breaking them, right? So, I was talking about uh, truce breaking um, and how the game became incredibly easy when I just uh, constantly just was truce breaking people because I couldn't be bothered to wait for truce timers. Um, so, say you've defeated someone's army and you want to take more land from them. Well, I mean, if you truce break, you get a minus 50. Minus 50, I don't know, yeah. Minus 50 general opinion, that's the modifier here. General, so everyone. Everybody gets minus 50 opinion on you, right? But if you're a living legend, everybody gets a, a plus 30 opinion bonus um, for being the living legend, right? And later on in the game, getting the living legend is easy. I mean, there's like, what, how many? I can create over 100 titles, including empire ranks, most of them being duchies, because the AI just doesn't want to make them because they don't need to. So, new king comes to power, I spend a little bit of gold, man becomes a living legend because he made a bunch of duchy titles, whoop de do uh, wins a couple of wars, it gets plus 30 relations with everyone, right? Now, this doesn't stack, Just think about that for a moment. Whereas in EU4, we had aggressive expansion. Whereas in CK2, we had direct vassal opinion went down by having their levees raised for too long. Though admittedly, you didn't have to use the levees when you had enough retinue. Um, kind of like CK3. But regardless, there were mechanics in place. There was also um, no there was stab loss for breaking truces. Now, admittedly, the whole you don't lose prestige is kind of like not losing stab, but not really. But it does help, because if you're spending a ton of prestige to break truces, then you might get defamed, lose your living legend, or whatever level of prestige you'd gotten from breaking that truce, and also costing you loads and loads of prestige means that you can't declare as many wars for prestige so this perk lets you avoid that and also short truces so if you don't want to truce break then you can just grab that perk and it shortens it by a couple of years i don't know how much exactly but it but it does shorten it so that that can be nice for people who want to take it a bit slower but if you don't want to take it slower um, you break truces, you don't lose prestige, very nice. The, the 50 relations thing won't matter later on in the game. I mean, I've got freaking dynastic kin, slayer, and murderer, and I still have positive relations with some characters. Like, most of my children are like, oh yeah, the guy's alright. Killed some family members, murdered some people in cold blood, broke truces, massive offensive war penalty. Most people are like, eh, I'll let him off, right? So, it's... And he hasn't even got any dread right now. I could have went and got some dread by executing a bunch of people. But as I said, I finished the run and I kind of released everyone from jail. But regardless, um, breaking truces, this doesn't stack. So you just have minus 50 general opinion. If you can handle that, then it doesn't matter. So 
which I definitely could handle for most of the game. So, yep. Very nice perk. Moving on. Defensive negotiations. Fellow, vassal, opinion, independent, ruler, opinion, and can propose one alliance without a marriage. This perk is situational, but can be very good. Um, if you are a vassal, say, of the HRE, or you're a... Um, vassal in france or italy or england or any large empire the byzantines etc etc this gets a lot better because you get the extra opinion with fellow vassals um but also you've got the uh proposed alliance now you can sometimes get some good allies out of it normally you won't if you're going down the diplomacy tree, you're probably, I mean, you have thoughtful, so you can send a gift, you can sway someone, you can get plus 100 relations with them. Maybe you can get defensive negotiations to get a, a really nice alliance out of it uh, without doing a marriage. It's possible, but it's not guaranteed. The opinion bonus is nice. So this is this is situational most time. This is pretty situational, but it can be handy. Then you have embassies, which each alliance grants you plus one diplomacy. This becomes more powerful as you get later in the game when you have a much wider reaching dynasty. Because you'll have a lot of people, uh, especially your sons and heirs, that you can just give land and then they'll ally you basically off the bat. Um, so that's a good way to get your diplomacy up, but not as much. Um Really, you'd take this as a prerequisite for Accomplished Forger, which makes the Fabricate claim on County Speed go up 75%. Now, this is more powerful if you have a high-learning um, bishop or, or court dude who does faith affairs, um, because then they can uh, create claims on entire duchies. And once you get into the High Medieval period, uh, you can get... Uh, or is it this one? Yeah. Divine Right from the High Medieval Period allows you to press several of your claims in a single war. Now, several of your claims means, say I have fabricated a claim on uh, the Duchy of um, Mazovia. I've created a claim on the Duchy of Mazovia, and it's owned by the King of Poland. Say I also have um, a couple of of county claims. I have a couple of county claims here in Lesser Poland. I don't have a claim on the entire county, but I have all the entire duchy, but I've got like these two as uh, county claims. I have Mazovia as a duchy claim, and I could have another county claim uh, up here in Prussia, right? I could push all of them at once. I could push all of those at once one button it would cost you more prestige because it, it calculates adding all of them together as far as prestige is concerned uh, but with if you combine uh the accomplished forger with a high skill or the ability to select a high skill uh priest or patriarch or whatever the title is for them with uh you know creating uh claims on like a mass scale and you also take Bellum Justum. So again, Bellum Justum is a little bit of a dip perk, if you would. Uh, you can claim huge swaths of territory without the need for force vassalization. Now, this becomes most relevant if you're attacking people of the same rank as you. So if you're an empire attacking another empire and you don't have Holy War CB, then that becomes relevant. Probably more useful in the 1066 star. In the 867 star, I found the AI was too incompetent to make their own empires. So, mostly because of forced partition. Honestly, forced partition is actually unhealthy for the state of the AI and the game as a whole. But I'll cover that as uh, maybe at another time, but maybe at the end of the video. Uh, but I'll come into the AI later on. Uh, right now we're looking at like the, the, the stuff that makes the run doable and really force vassalage is where it's at but diplomacy in general is really powerful. Force vassalage, very very good. I do remember some stages in the game where I wanted defensive negotiations. Flexible truces is very powerful as you get later into the game. Force vassalage is more of that midpoint or early to midpoint 
where you've you've just claimed your first kingdom or empire title and you're just starting to gobble up your neighbors so force fashion is just good for that um a forger is a bit more niche but certainly down to here and here these five are absolutely a must at some point in your game you will be picking these multiple rulers in a row because that is just the best thing to do right on to august now august is a bit of an interesting one um it increases your sway scheme power you get monthly prestige from dread and knights monthly prestige per powerful vassal offer vassalization acceptance now these aren't that important right these are not that great not gonna lie these are these are pretty shit actually <laughs> um but off of vassalization acceptance can be incredibly powerful if you're an empire but you don't own all of your empire so for example if you uh, create the Roman Empire, you get a special CB to declare war on anyone bordering you who owns Roman provinces. Now, the Empire rank of the Roman Empire, when I created the Roman Empire rank, it gave me claim... Well, it technically put everything inside the Roman Empire, so this title now is actually the title of the map. Um, except Mali, because... Mali was my last conquest, so it didn't quite include Mali. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's Mali. But everywhere else is part of the Roman Empire. Um, but, yeah, say you just about took everything required to form the Roman Empire. You didn't take more than that. And then you formed it. You would have additional uh, area in, in, in the UK, in Germany, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, possibly in the Middle East and in Iberia or North Africa as well, in Egypt especially, you would have more claims to push. Uh, and you could offer vassalization to some people uh, for free. Now, right at the start of the game, in the 867 star, if you start as the Byzantines, you can actually offer vassalization to quite a large majority of bordering counts and dukes in Sicily, Naples, uh, in Illyria, um, parts of the Middle East, uh, using the true ruler uh, bonus and having a decent uh, diplomacy score. So, August is useful mostly for true ruler. Uh, there is the commission epics. This is kind of a whatever thing. It's it's fine. It's nothing special. Um, Level of Fame Impact is an interesting one because this is actually really good if you know that you can get Living Legend. So once you're at a stage of the game where you can just create enough titles to become a Living Legend or fight a bunch of wars to become a Living Legend, you can guarantee you'll be able to do that within the first 10 years of your character's rule. Then it doubles the effects of being a Living Legend, which is a plus 60 secular opinion now the number of knights at that point won't matter but plus 60 secular opinion that negates truce breaking which is obviously very op um so yeah a life of glory is is actually kind of handy and secular opinion is literally all non-temple vassals or independent rulers so it can also be useful and used in combination with things uh, like um, true ruler obviously uh, people outside of your realm are going to have a higher opinion of you because they have a plus 60 secular opinion so a duke who is supposed to be part of your empire now gets a plus 25 off of vassalization acceptance but also a plus 60 general opinion as opposed to a plus 30 which combined with a quick gift from thoughtful might put them up to 100 uh you could even maybe get an alliance with them in the defense of negotiations and then that would increase their uh, offer vassalization chance and some of the dukes actually get really big so that could acquire you a large chunk of territory as long as it's somewhat de jure in your empire Right, then you get Dignitas, which gives Diplomacy per level of fame, uh, whatever. If you, re if you really want to go for August, then you can, but I think it basically stops it. This is the, the, this is the weakest of the Diplomacy tree, and it still has some uses. More niche, but it, it, it's got its place. Um, 
family hierarch is it, this is probably the most powerful one because of the way that you can abuse it with how the ai works but family hierarch isn't bad either so this is the one you'll have seen people meme about with making 100 stat man or 200 stat man or how freaking high they can get their stats honestly the amount of effort it takes to get your stats that high is not really worth it but you know family hierarch's got some good perks particularly groom to rule all your children receive one to three extra skill points this is retroactive so if you have seven children already they'll all get the extra skill points right which makes them slightly more competent it's not a huge deal but it's you know if you're trying to make your air as good as possible that it's a quick perk you can grab and it's kind of handy Part of the family gives close family opinion. Uh, this is kind of irrelevant, but, you know, if you've got a bunch of brothers, especially, if you have a lot of brothers and sisters who have titles either in your kingdom or outside the realm, this, because it's only close family opinion, so they have to be directly related to you. So if you've got, like, several brothers, this, this is actually really handy with Vikings, because Vikings have tons of concubines, um, they are expected to pass out a bunch of land. They can also conquer a bunch of land. So you'll have lots of brothers, and if your brothers have higher opinion of you, they'll be more likely to join your wars and that's and not declare war on you and that sort of thing. So this can be more useful in certain circumstances with different um, cultures and faiths, but uh, this is, generally speaking, not a huge deal useful or not hugely useful. Personal scheme success chance against family members, also not that relevant. Uh, but we do have Befriend. Now, the Befriend scheme is very good. Um, all you need to... I wonder if I can reset here. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, you, you literally just go... Uh, I'm going to uh, get Befriend scheme, right-click a character, uh, Befriend. It will be one of the personal schemes here. It might be under more. But you can just... Um, yeah, you just click befriend. When it actually has a generally very high chance of success, generally speaking, as long as you're not completely diplomacy inept, and if you are, just get a wife that's good at diplomacy, and you can do that. Um, and all you need to do is just befriend every um, powerful vassal. Just uh, powerful vassals are denoted by the uh, the little fist here. Uh, as you get a higher rank title, you'll have more powerful vassals. If you just befriend all of your powerful vassals, then they won't join factions against you, and then the majority of your power base is safe. You can also use um, befriend as a way of uh, getting people to uh, leave their courts and join yours for whatever reason. Uh, it can help with claimants, uh, like family members who don't like you, who have claims to your titles, it, Befriend can help keep them in line. So Befriend is a really simple, but very, very powerful. It Honestly, it pushes their opinion up by like plus 100 or something. It's, it's pretty crazy. So for the general opinion purpose and for getting rid of rebels, it's actually a pretty handy perk. Um, each friend adds 5% stress gain. So if you're going to bother getting a bunch of friends... Uh, this means that you lose less, uh, you you gain less stress from doing actions that would stress you out, which can make certain options in events and you know general dialogue uh, a lot more appealing. Um, and also, say you have a honest character and you want to do lots of intrigue, uh, this can help them, uh, you know, manage their intrigue. So confidants can be useful. Flatterer gives you a befriend scheme power bonus, so if you really want to worry about getting tons of friends, uh, you probably want to get Flatterer. Um, that then leads to friendly counsel. Each of your friend relations gives you two random skill points. Now, if you combine this with, say, pedagogy, where your wards can become your friends, and then you just get friendly counsel, and you start befriending all of your counsellors, uh, counselors being um, the guys on your council and your powerful vassals uh, you can end up with easily incredibly high skill points now they don't matter that much as I said the bonuses here aren't actually that huge um, I guess the biggest one would be intrigue but even then the, they're not and also general opinion but generally speaking the bonuses here aren't like huge so it's mostly for the mostly for the opinion modifier, but you know if you're gonna have a bunch of friends anyway, say you did pick up pedagogy, you've got lots of heirs, and you've been uh, 
making sure you teach uh, a couple of them as often as possible. Then um, friendly council plus befriending all your vassals can be really uh, can be quite powerful uh, as a nice little icing on the cake kind of powerful as opposed to like you want to just focus entirely on this. And then Sound Foundations gives you an extra skill point for every living child you have, which obviously in any kind of uh, concubine based, I have more spouses. I mean, this guy's got 10 children and he's 39, so he could easily pop out another 10. Uh, it's 20 extra skill points. So, yeah, you know, it, it's it's fine. And then and then you might as well go for Patriarch. Basically, if you ever get to the point where you can get the final perk, I mean, you might as well because they're normally pretty good. Um, they're not like insane, but they're normally pretty decent. But yeah, like family hierarchy is fine. You've got befriend, which is really powerful. Groom to rule, which is kind of like nice to always take. Aside from that, it's kind of if you really want to go into it. But the 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 really most powerful stuff is here. Now, of course, of course, everything I've said take with a pinch of salt. It could have been changed. Liable to changes. Uh, and and as always you know play to whatever you find fun but for purposes of pure optimal value as i've said these five really good niche niche really good really good but still also kind of niche uh a sort of early game there um Early game slash niche, early game slash niche, niche stuff, uh, niche, also niche, also niche, uh, niche, F. niche but more relevant more often and again niche but more relevant more often so like the only perks in the game which aren't like very situational are these ones which will you'll find uses for across multiple characters regardless of what you're focusing them on but for the like most of the time the perks are sort of depends what's going on in your game so what does that what does that mean what does that mean well Paradox has put all these very flashy um, perks at the bottom with like, oh, look at all these amazing powers that you're going to get. Um, most of the time you'll go, cool, I'm going to go on a scholarship focus because I want to build up my dev and I want to grab um, pedagogy and I want to grab uh, planned cultivation because I want to keep, I want to get some of my uh, dev up. So I'm going to go scholarship focus, right? And then the second you've got all those perks, you'll go... Right, I'm planning on doing a couple of wars, so I'm going to flip into Marshall. I'm going to go with a chivalry focus, and then I'm going to grab Bellum Justum, and as soon as I get that, I'm going to start the war. Then I'm going to grab um, a stalwart leader uh, during the war, or slightly before I start the war, or whatever. And then I'm going to grab Serve the Crown for after I finish the war with all the land. Uh, then I'm going to jump over to Stewardship. I'm going to grab Golden Obligations. I'm going to grab It's My Domain. I'm going to make more cash to try build up that land I just conquered. Then I'm going to flip into Diplomacy right at the end and grab uh, Benevolent Intent to increase my sway power. I'm going to grab Thoughtful just to get my uh, pesky vassals in line. So you, you get the idea. Like Depending on what you need to do is what you need to pick, right? Do not focus entirely on just going, oh, that looks like a good perk, I'll go for that. Or like somebody said that having loads of health is really good because my guy lasts longer. Well, yes, they do, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you should focus on it because living longer achieves nothing inherently. Inherently, just living till 80 but spending the, the extra 20 years that the character had just sat on his ass thinking, well, my kingdom looks pretty. Well, that's completely pointless, isn't it? So, you know, only do things if they have a point or a purpose. So, yeah, if you're going to take perks, you know, try to actually use them as opposed to just having them. Uh, though having more perks is never bad, it is good to have some kind of game plan with how you're going to use your perks. So, yeah, some little hints and tips about, or at least at least my impressions of how perks work in CK3, but also like the good ones and the ones that helped me do a WC I've now highlighted for you all. 
Wow, Jesus, this recording is going on for a long time. <laughs> this this recording probably will be quite long. I'm not going to split it up. You know, if people bothered to watch the World Conquest series and they're really that interested in, you know, f figuring out my thought process or my opinions for some of the stuff that I used, then you're probably going to watch this. And I'm glad if you've made it this far already. It's, it's an hour in and uh, I have rambled quite a lot. But we've talked about some of the really OP stuff that definitely made the run easy, uh, too easy in some ways. Let's talk about why. The why. Now, I, I, I do like to go into the why. Why is it easy? What has allowed us to interact with the game the way that we have interacted with the game? And honestly, this is what this is something I've noticed in so many video games recently. But like you know, I've been playing Baldur's Gate three recently, um, but also just in video games in general. And and it makes me feel like I don't know, maybe they just don't hire people to to beta test games, or or their beta tests are just shit, right? Or or they or they give the they give beta testers I don't want to just say beta testers are shit, but they give people the wrong direction. Of like how to test their games, they go, "Oh yeah, here's the game. Just have fun." That's that's literally not the point. You're supposed to crunch. You're supposed to crunch the crap out of it. You know, try to break it. You gotta really push the limits of everything, and that's why I think CK3 has some serious balancing issues, right? You know, the fact that I have a totally intentional, right? I haven't glitched this number. I have a completely intentional amount of holdings and a completely intentional amount of holding upgrades, right? And my army can absolutely evaporate anything the AI could throw at me at this stage of the game. I was fighting the Abbasids at the peak of their strength. The Abbasids owned almost all of the Middle East and Persia and, and the Iran area and they owned all the way up into the steppes. They, and like, you know, a decent chunk, like over here, like on the borders of Turkey and, and even parts of uh, like the North Africa stretch up in Cyrenaica, the Abbasids were a powerhouse. They were pushing, I'm pretty sure they were pushing into India as well, but they were, they were the biggest threat of the game. And after one war with them, they didn't have any troops anymore. One war. Because they couldn't fight me. I'd fight 60,000 of their levee and they would get obliterated. Why is that? Because levee are a 10-10 unit, right? My pikemen are 90-87. Which means every single one pikeman that I have is worth 9 levee. But, it's, but that is not how the calculation works, right? Damage and toughness, right? These guys got 87 toughness, right? So when a levee attacks these guys, there's a much lower chance that they actually do anything, right? But when, when these guys attack the levee back, there's a nine times higher damage to their toughness, which means every time these guys attack the levee, like not, now, I now please take this. Please take everything I say from this point onwards. I'm just speculating because I don't, I don't know the exact behind the scenes how it calculates battles. But based on the information I have, this is what I'm going on. Pikeman with these stats attacks Leve. Pikeman kills nine Leve. Nine Leve have to attack Pikeman to kill one Pikeman, right? So for, so every time these a thousand dudes attack, they're going to be doing nine, you know, nine each. Each of them's going to be able to kill nine levee without much trouble. And it requires nine levee to kill one of them, which means I'm actually fielding like 9,000 troops, right? When I fight the Abbasids, they have 60,000 men. Yeah. I have what when I raise my level let's go raise my levees over here All right you can see I have an army of 12,000 500 of them are cannons right 
So I have an effective army of 12,000, right? About 12,000. But that's times nine when talking about my opponent's levy. Times nine. So I have 90,000 troops that can instantly teleport anywhere on the planet because of the way the game works. As I said, take with a pinch of salt. But the, as far as the maths go, that, that does add up, right? I, I effectively have nine times the troops of them. Now, the Abbasids at the height of their power were fielding about 60,000 levy, which meant I had 1.5 times their number in stats at the later stages of the game. Now, even if I included the Abbasids' men-at-arms, they didn't stand a chance. They got obliterated. If you watch the, uh, the videos, which I'm assuming you probably have... Um, you saw, I, I, you know, I was getting bored because there was there was nobody that could fight me, and I, I hadn't even conquered the majority of the map yet. I still had a massive chunk of the map I needed to carve through, but I was able to just like, uh, just go completely brain AFK and just walk into people's stacks, and they would just melt instantly. There was nobody that could fight us, and these are completely intentional, as far as I can tell. These are the numbers that the devs expect people to get to. Alright. Now if the player is able to get to those uh, numbers. Why doesn't the AI? Why doesn't the AI have a large number of men at arms that can fight me? Well honestly the AI never bothered to max out their men at arms. They never did that. Um. Now, there's a few reasons for this. There's a few reasons that I believe why this happened, right? Let's take a look at some of the buildings, uh, some of the counties, shall we? This, uh, this is actually the Duke, but, um, uh, look, 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 this is a, well, it says a barony, but, um, it's actually a city. It's a city holding. City holding actually has, uh, quite high level buildings. Why? Why is that? Well, because the city holding is only ever held by one character, right? The 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 Republic, the burger, the burger who owns that city, um, in kind of CK2 terms, if you would, but the guy who owns that city has nothing better to do. He can't go make claims. He can't go conquer other people. He's got nothing better to do with his gold except sit there and build and make it bigger. Which means the city is going to get quite powerful. Uh, same goes with temple holdings, right? Temple holding, pretty high development. The guy who owns this, now it, it's a bit different in Islamic countries because you could, secular characters can hold temple holdings. But generally speaking, in you know, we'll go to the center of Catholic Europe. Um, temple holding, maxed out. Why? The bishop's got nothing better to do than sit there. It's not like he'd go and carve himself an empire. There's only a couple of prince bishop bricks in the game. Um, so they just sit there, and all they do is they build up their holdings. That's all they do. So the temples and the cities are very well developed. Now let's take a look at the barony. Two and everything. We're in, we're in 1368. These could be level frickin' 8, right? Look, look at my land. I can build this up to level 8 now, right? Um, I, I, I haven't even finished all these because I, I didn't need to um, at that stage of the game. But look, they're all like level 6. I, I built them up pretty damn high, okay? This, 2. 2. His men-at-arms are a fraction of the power that mine could be, right? And he's not making very much money, right? Only one building's really making him money, the hamlets here. Now, let's say that that baron... That baron... Wants to take more land. He has to pay for men at arms. He has to pay for his raised levy. He has to pay, uh, you know, if he wants to fight wars, he's got to pay for maintenance. And his buildings provide him a lot less money than the temple buildings do. You know, cloisters, 1.3 taxes, and the ranches. The, the freaking burgers, they've got three buildings that provide taxes, right? Now, his direct vassals, which will be these two guys, they will pay him money. They will pay him a portion of their taxes. Which is probably about the only thing 
that's keeping this baron or whoever owns this province afloat i mean it's actually the king but um you know if there was if there was a, a a little baron around here somewhere or even just the duke that owns it you know look he owns munchen barony of munchen i'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly but one one two one doesn't have any temples or or cities to keep him afloat right and they ain't gonna build more they ain't gonna build more holdings look at all this tribal land that's flipped feudal and they're just baronies and they're and they're and they're fucking worthless they haven't even filled all their building slots right look at that he's got that's it i've i've owned poland for uh, like over a hundred years now and they've done nothing it's all fucking worthless like m well most of it's pretty pretty worthless so the ai uh, you know even if we look at the at the at the heartlands right we're looking at the baghdad region right it's got the freaking so it's got some it's got the house of wisdom which gives a holding taxes boost right it's, it didn't even build anything but if we look at baghdad's temple uh, Baghdad's temple is not worth that much, but the city, the city is all level six. They've been keeping up with tech. They've been building things, but the actual main barony, they haven't been doing it, you know. And it's, it's uh, there are some places where it has been built up. Why? I couldn't tell you why some places were built up and some weren't. Maybe it's because this guy uh, directly owned. A bishopric, which which is is worth a lot of money. Maybe he directly owned this, which was giving him loads of taxes because he's an Islamic character, you know. But in Europe, it's it's the same thing wherever you go, you know. Most of the baronies, temple, a a a a, city, eights across the board, pretty much. Baronies, two, barely above level two, right? Barely barely above level two. City, eights. Barony. Uh, this one's actually a little bit more built up, but this doesn't provide taxes. These are all like, you know, ones and twos. Temple, eight, right? Because of the taxes and the maintenance that barony or, or, or lords, you know, the barons, dukes, counts, you know, the lordly characters, they because of the things that they have to pay, they don't build up their cities or the, the, the they don't build up the castles. Their taxes are naturally lower because of the buildings they have access to. So their direct income is lower, right? So that, and they don't build up the provinces as much. Now let's, now what makes this a real, the biggest issue to this, right? It's not necessarily the AI don't build it up. It's actually par partition succession, right? It's partition succession. Because partition succession or particularly confederate partition which is what kills the early game so much in 867 but even just normal partition upon succession all titles held by the late ruler will be divided among their eligible uh, eligible children with the player heir always being given the primary title realm capital and any direct de jure titles associated with it as vassals it should state that the direct de jure titles are as vassals so say i am the duke of bohemia and i own every county i own all the counties in bohemia and it's a pre duchy of bohemia is got quite a lot of counties right i own all of them i die i have three sons my main son will acquire the main duchy title which could also be the kingdom of bohemia you know he could be the king of bohemia but wait if he's the king, the next lowest title is duchy. So the, the duchy title actually gets passed out to one of his brothers. So one of his brothers gets to be duke. He gets to be king, though. So, you know, he's still in control, but not as direct control. So that affects taxes. Three of the counties go to his brother, who's the duke. Four of the counties go to his other brother, who doesn't get to be a duke. He just gets to be king. So what does the king get? Well, the king, the king, okay, he, the king might keep the duchy title, but you, you're following the line of thought here. This is actually how it works in game. 
almost all of the counties get passed away to his brothers. He is left with the county of Pilsen, which is, or, or you know, the this one, the county of uh, Prague. He gets the county of Prague because it's the, the realm capital of Bohemia. And that's it. So he gets one, one barony, and everybody else gets more baronies. Right? Now let's compound that. When his brothers die, they're going to pass out their counties to their sons. So they're going to split his the three that he got. They're going to each go to a separate son. The four that these this guy got, they're going to go to his sons. Now every single county in Bohemia is owned by a different character. Right? And early on in the game, this is exactly what happens. Early on in the game, everything gets partitioned all the time. This makes for very divided and weak characters because they don't have consolidated power this is why the barony trick is so powerful because it gives you a leg up during the partition period right now yes you can just murder all of your heirs but the ai doesn't do that the ai plays by the normal rules which means that consolidated power just isn't a thing and because they can't consolidate their power, they can't consolidate their units, which means constant turmoil and infighting, which means they have to spend all their gold being at war, right? If they spend all their gold being at war, they can't build up their baronies. If they can't build up their baronies, they can't make more money, which then spirals into a continuous circle where the AI doesn't build up the baronies, they can't get better troops, they can't consolidate their power, their vassals don't, you know... The empire, the emperor will have one county, one county and one duchy. He'll have the main duchy title, he'll have the realm capital, he'll have that kingdom title, and he'll have the empire title. Now, yes, everybody does pay him taxes, but I can tell you, to actually upkeep a men-at-arms unit like this, vassal taxes ain't gonna cut it. Look at that. I own... All of the entire fucking world. And I get six. Six from direct vassals. Six. Do you, do you know how many kingdoms I own? Well, I mean, to, to be accurate, I own one single empire title. Which means that all of the kings uh, will be direct vassals of this empire title. Uh, I don't know if the game's updated, so maybe it isn't re recalling it properly, but honestly, vassal taxes are a joke. They they are actually a they are a big meme, okay? Vassal taxes are a huge meme. Um the kind of taxes that are not a meme is uh, church holdings. Church holdings make good money. Why? Well, because the people that own the churches actually bother to build them up. At least to some reasonable degree. So church holdings always make hella cash for the stage of the game that you're in. Okay? So church holdings are actually relevant. But look at that. Unraised men at arms. 38.6 maintenance. For having unraised. If I raise them. You'll see that cost skyrocket. I'm now losing 27 gold. It triples. It more or less triples. Whatever their maintenance is. Okay? From being unraised. Now even with. Highly developed. Nine provinces. I can't pay for these men at arms. Does that mean the men at arms are too expensive? No. The men at arms aren't too expensive. Men at arms having a professional army. And that's also not raising the 32,000 levy I have as well. Because they would also cost me cash. But men at arms should be expensive. You should have to build up a war chest. I appreciate that. That. Um aspect of the game you should have a war chest you should have an economy to finance a proper army but an, an economy requires you know buildings that's what represents economy in this game is built i mean development does as well but you know holding taxes require buildings to levy those taxes and the ai just don't they don't build up the baronies which are the main source of income for the the warrior cast, you know, the temples, the, the priests ain't going to go out and fight. I mean, yes, in some faiths that they do. So, you know, again, take most of what I say with a pinch of salt. But, you know, 
the priests aren't the ones giving you levies. You know, if I if I look at the feudal contract of of the king here, uh, of of uh, Al Blank, and I um, uh, it, it might be because of his faith that I can't change his feudal contract. I don't really know. Anyway, um, modify feudal contract. Uh, so th this guy's he's only paying me what current obligation level, one point two percent of his levies and point five percent of his taxes. He's a king. He pays me no taxes. Taxable income of 5.7. 2.7 from his domain. 2.7. This king makes 2.7 gold directly. 3 from his vassals. And 23. 23 levies. 1% of his total, 2,000. This man has 2,000 men to his name. He's a king. He has a pathetic army. It's... He... he His total forces are 2,600. 600 of them being men-at-arms, right? I have... 10... Well, not 10 times that number, but, you know... Uh, given that my unit stats absolutely outclass his as well, without a joke. Look how much land this man owns. King of Pomerania, man owns most of, you know, the south here as well as the north there. Man's pretty powerful. The King of East Francia. Now, this is a powerful man, but he also owns all of East Francia, which is actually one of the better developed provinces in the game, or, or areas. He has 27,000 men, right? 20,000 of them are levies, and 7,000 of them are men-at-arms. And his men-at-arms would still fall over in a second flat, right? Frankfurt, his main barony, or, or this barony here, this is a, just a set, an, another castle that he owns, barely developed. The actual barony itself, not really that well developed. In fact, his levy size is compounded by the 20% bonus to that, all the holdings in the duchy. So he's getting a much higher levy count from the city, not that the city really gives him very much. But um, his baronies are slightly more well developed because it's Germany. But this is in freaking 1360, 1370. There's only about 50 years left in the game. And these have got another like five levels to go. I think the problem with partition is it removes power away from the main title holder. Um, too often. And by doing that, it causes internal strife. Internal strife causes wars. The AI has to spend money to fight those wars. They don't then spend that money building up their lands. Because they don't build up their lands, they have less levy. And their men-at-arms are weaker. Uh, they have less taxes. Because they have less taxes, they can't get as many men-at-arms. Because they don't have as many men-at-arms or levies or taxes, they can't go conquer more land. And even if they did, they would have to just give it away because of partition. Allah. Nobody has... Uh, not Allah as in <laughs> the Islamic <laughs> uh, deity. Uh, Allah as in, you know... As in... Uh, they don't have any power. The AI has no power. They can't, they can't, after a certain point, they can't stop you. It's physically impossible the way the AI is currently designed to function. They just cannot physically stop you. Now, how would you solve this? How would you solve this? Well, I guess you give the AI more weight to building up their own lands. Because the amount you can build up your lands is dictated by your tech. You know? It's not like the AI would be forced to constantly build up all the time. Because eventually, they would hit their cap of tech. And they wouldn't be able to build up anymore. You know? So... They wouldn't be stuck building things all the time. And they would have more money and more levy to actually, you know, be a threat. You know, have some power. Would it make the AI too powerful? Maybe, but probably not. I mean, the AI is still the AI, the player is still the player. 
So I, I doubt that the AI would become too powerful. You couldn't handle them if they just focused on building a bit more. Um, they would become a credible threat, or at least you would hope so. I mean, I hadn't touched um, the Abbasids for a very long time, and they were just a complete cakewalk. I thought they were going to be a, like an actual... They were a nuisance. They were, they were just a nuisance. Um... So yeah, that's one of the big whys. Why is a why is a world conquest achievable, and why is Paradox's AI still so shit? Um, this is what brings me back to the whole: Did you test this game? Yes, Paradox clearly tested this game quite a lot. But what they tested were the role-playing elements because that's what really sells Crusader Kings. But, you know, people are going to want to map paint. People, you give people the option to form the Roman Empire, people are going to want to form the Roman Empire. People are going to want to play as Mongolia and conquer the Mongolian Empire. Um, people like making big kingdoms. Is the gameplay good to support that? Up to a point. Up to the, the point that you own two empires, you know, you reform the Empire of Iberia, maybe you conquer the Empire of France... Maybe you conquer Britannia as well. But once you've conquered that, you're at the power level where there is no threats left in the game. There are no threats left. As long as you've got the men-at-arms to support it, there are, there are no threats. Which, having the men-at-arms to support it is based on this. Okay? It's based on this. Which is primarily based on your succession law, but... Um, you can kind of circumvent that by having a large province with lots of baronies in it, but th that requires a lot of investment. So, you know, it's not like the player just gets a free handout just because they know how partition works, um, but the, the AI doesn't have the cash to build additional holdings. Like, the AI is never going to build this holding, and they're never going to do it. I mean, they barely even make new titles. Um, they just don't have the wealth, and even if they do have the wealth, like, this guy's got... This guy's got 2,000 fucking gold. It, it, is he gonna build up his per, his personal holdings? You know, he's got he's got a ton of counties, right? Uh, he's got uh, the county of uh, Madeira. Um, I don't exactly know precisely what he holds, but he owns uh, Tamazna over here. Is he gonna build up this holding? This castle? I, I don't see him constructing something. Nothing's being constructed there right now. But buddy, you got 2,000 gold. Um, if he wanted to avoid partition, you know, there's a, there's an additional slot here. He could construct a new castle. It only cost him 400 gold, maybe 600 or 800 gold. I mean, he's got the cash. He's got the cash to do that. He's currently, he is losing money. Probably from having his troops raised, because he is currently at war. So having his troops raised will mean that he is spending money. So maybe he doesn't want to spend money making buildings. But I can almost guarantee you that once that war is done, he might build one or two buildings. He'll hold a feast, he'll go on a hunt. He won't build He won't build a new, new duchy building. He, he won't build a new uh, barony, he won't do that. Despite having two thousand gold, so is it something wrong with the AI's coding? I think it's I think it's something wrong with the AI's waiting. They don't put enough emphasis on improving their realm. They put too much of an emphasis on stockpiling or or just being a fucking idiot, I guess, and just starting wars that they can't win because they don't have a power base to fight them. Um. I mean, when you play EU4, even doing like an EU4 world conquest, so like you know, technology means that even AI with like and also combat width and that sort of thing, there are mechanics in place to make even smaller AI and their armies not a total pushover in the late game because you know a smaller uh, nation will have uh, developed a lot more. They can still field fifty thousand men. Those fifty thousand men with the correct uh, of era tech are going to be able to hold off one of your stacks. I mean, you'll probably still roll over them, but, um, you know, if you were to go, oh, well, it's only an OPM, I'll send 20k troops after them, they will stack wipe you, and they will hold on to their land, they'll go and siege some of your fortresses down, they'll be a nuisance, right? They're not going to stop you on your world conquest, but you do need to actually put a credible amount of units on the board to go and fight them. 
You don't have to do that in CK3. The bonuses from these buildings and the way that the AI is inept and just cannot handle how uh, buildings work, it, it compounds into a problem where there is no credible... After a certain period in the game, there are no credible threats. The AI ceases to be a threat in any way, shape, or form. And unlike EU4, where the AI isn't a threat, but you still at least need to pay attention to what they're doing, I don't even need to pay attention to what they're doing. If you if you watch my videos, you'll see I literally go, cool, right, fighting the Abbasids, here we go. Let's spawn the army over here. Let's go and we'll go and burn, we'll go move here, we'll siege up a castle. The castle will siege in about four days. All right, this castle siege. Right, let's move to the next one. Let's go siege that castle down. We'll siege that down in a few days. And the Abbasids are running around like headless chickens uh, over here with their levee. They have to spend, you know, uh, three months raising all of their levee. By the time that they've raised their levee, I've already sacked 50% war score. And then I just go, cool. So I've sacked all the war score that's, uh, that's like, over here that's close, you know, tight knit bundled together i'll just move my rally point over here and then i'll go and take some of their land over here now the abbasid army is all the way up here if they want to go resiege their land they can by the time that they resiege a single castle over here i'll have already ended the war ai is not a credible threat so you know Mo it's not it's and yeah you you know you could say to yourself all right i'm gonna do it without teleporting my army around right but but that doesn't stop me going, right, I'm going to go fight the Abbasids. Where's their highest concentration of fortresses that they own? Right, their highest concentration of power is in Egypt here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say I own Turkey, right? And I'm trying to declare war to take over um, the Jeru the Kingdom of Jerusalem and um, this sort of uh, region of the Middle East, you know, um, sort of the Israel, uh, 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 Lebanon uh, area. Um, I'm going to raise my troops. Right. And whilst my men at arms are now fully ready, I'm going to start separately raising my levies. Right. This army is going to be marching and plowing through various different forts as we make our way to their capital. Maybe to try it like the capitals over here somewhere in Damascus. Try and siege that down and capture like their air or something to make the war a bit faster. I don't have to teleport them around. It's not. I don't. It would be. It would take a lot longer to do a world conquest if I couldn't teleport them around, because it allows me to start multiple wars and just finish wars against large nations much quicker. But you know, it. it I. I could. I could just go through the lab, laborious process of marching these guys down, and sieging everything individually, and then, and then just, and then just rather than, uh, despawning them. Rather than despawning them, moving the flag, and respawning them somewhere else to just get the sieges done faster, um, I'd just walk up and do it normally. That would work too. It would take longer, but it would work. Um, the real teleporting issue is when I teleport my army halfway across the globe, and it requires no time for them to rally. Doesn't take any time at all. Um, however, if they added a rallying time to men at arms, it would have to be static, maybe a week. Maybe rally, maybe you can't rally men at arms whilst they've taken casualties. So you have to wait till they fully replenish. That could work, but then later on in the game, my men at arms weren't taking any casualties anyway, and any casualties they had taken would get replenished within a month. So that just stalls you for a month whilst you wait for the reinforcement tick. Is that is that a reasonable thing? Sure, I guess. And then what? They still delete every army they come up across. That that's just putting a speed bump. That that fit, that that just puts a carpet over the over the mess. That it, it hides it. It doesn't fix it. How do you fix it? So I've talked a lot about why. Uh, some of the mechanics work the way they do. Why are they overpowered? Why are the AI just incapable of handling late game powerhouses? What do we do about it, right? 
Well, we can restrict ourselves. I know that's what some people have been doing. They've been going, right, I'll do a challenge game. I'll restrict myself. No, that's that that's not good enough, right? This is a fully priced, and I've seen it more and more and more and more with video games recently. I know this is going to come across as a bit of a rant, but more and more we've seen video games release a full price. I, sometimes they say they're in early access, and I'll, I'll give people the benefit of the doubt. If they're, you know, like, I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3. If it's in early access, I can forgive them for having some graphical glitches. I can forgive them for having some, you know, some issues with... Uh, maybe maybe bugs that cause certain mechanics to not function the way that they're supposed to. But CK3 was released. It was released. It and and I know I know we, as a Paradox fan, we all know that Paradox. This is not what the final version of the game is going to look like, right? But I remember playing games when you bought them. That was the game. Any extras were not the final game they were they were expansions you, you felt good about getting them because it expanded what was in the base game but the base game was perfectly serviceable in its original uh, incarnation you know um to the other strategy games you know in the title you know Nobody's going to pick up Age of Empires 2 and go, oh no, you absolutely can't play that without Forgotten Kingdoms. You know, without Forgotten Kingdoms, Age of Empires 2 is completely unplayable, right? And sure, community patches have helped to patch out a lot of broken stuff, but there's nothing stopping you from playing Age of Empires 2 um, in its base game and, and it being a completely broken mess. It's not a completely broken mess. It's a completely serviceable game. It has a competitive environment. Uh, it's good. Shogun 2 Total War widely hailed as one of the best Total Wars uh, to date. When Shogun 2's original game was out, I played all of the Total Wars on their original release, pretty well, except um, Shogun 1 and Medieval Total War 1, but I played Rome Total War 1 on its original release, and yeah, there was some overpowered stuff in that, but you know, you didn't question it and go, oh boy, like, I feel like this game could do with so much more. Like, where are these features that were in the previous titles that I no longer have access to. And we will ask ourselves that with CK3. And this, you know, one of the strongest elements of Crusader Kings is the role-playing element. Uh, where's our secret societies? Where's the ability to play in a republic? Um... You know, where's our bloodlines and dynasties, the artifacts that we can uh, collect and uh, those sorts of things. Um, I can't remember all of the features that were in. Um... Where, where's the where's the life? The, the li I know there's lifestyles like they've done it as perks now. And whilst you have a certain focus set, you can get certain events. But, you know, like the lifestyles in CK2 were admittedly they were better they were something that you earned through a event chain where you had to make decisions along that chain of events to try to get a lifestyle and yes there's events tied but after after the you know two or three playthroughs of crusader kings 3 you'll know what all the events are um so you know because it's just an xp system it's not like I need to have this certain event fire to get a lifestyle, to get the lifestyle that I want for this character, which is somewhat RNG. It's just like, nah, I'll just pick this lifestyle. Eventually, I'll get the event that I want. Like, it's it's more consistent. I suppose consistency to the player is a good thing, but it also makes it a bit more, you know, gamey because you can just pick pick the things that you want. Now, honestly, I feel like the lifestyle system is good. This is not criticism of the lifestyle system. What I'm really criticizing is that, you know, there will be DLC for CK3, which fixes some of these issues. Does it need DLC to fix these issues? N no. Uh, a lot of a lot of the things that, you know, there'll be like a uh, Art of War DLC for CK3 that fixes, which changes the mechanics of warfare and and fixes the way that you it makes combat more tactical and it will have all these flashy terms of bullshit and we'll all buy it 
We'll all buy it. I'm not. I'm not saying I ain't gonna buy it. I will. I like CK3. You know, for all the criticism that I give it, I like. I I enjoyed my playthrough of CK3. Sure, by the end of a world conquest, it was getting dull. But that's just that's just paradox map painting. It's more of a personal achievement. It's not the intentional way to play CK3. Well, I mean. You know, when they say, here's a map of the world, you're allowed to conquer it. Obviously, I'm going to try and conquer it. That's part of the achievement of the game. But you don't have to, right? You absolutely don't have to. I mean, you could play the, the, the entire game from, 18, uh, from 867 to 1421 or whatever as a count that never conquers anything. If you, if you really want, you know, it, more power to you, buddy. But, but... At some point, we'll get sold a DLC or something that tries to fix the way combat works, and you don't need that. We, do, we don't need a DLC to fix why the game is so easy in certain respects, in, and fixing certain mechanics about the game, right? Add a, add a, a month... Mu add a mustering timer. You can't muster your men-at-arms when they've taken casualties. That'll stop some of the teleporting around bullshit. Um, honestly, if you just made the AI more competent with building things in their land, they would become a more credible threat in the late game. Because, you know, if you start in England, you have to spend like a couple of hundred years fixing up the British Empire, uh, and then, or the, you know, Britannia as an empire. You have to build up your land, you have to get rid of the Vikings, you've got to convert places and culture convert and stop rebellions, and you have to stabilize this empire. And once you've done that, then you can think, right, let's go and invade France, a couple of hundred years spent invading France, we're now in the 1200s, in the Middle, middle Ages, or maybe you did it in 100 years, and you took Spain in the next 100 years, and you're in the 1200s, and you're quite the powerhouse, and you're like, right, However, whilst you've been doing that, it's not like the AI have been sat still. Maybe Russia's formed, there's a big Mongolian Empire, the Abbasids are still hella powerful, Mali's formed down here, you know, the Deccan Empire has formed, and you're thinking to yourself, crap, now I've got to fight these really big empires. That's going to be tough. But you think to yourself, right, I'm going to do it because I want to, I want to, I don't know, I'm going to go on a crusade against the Abbasids, right? You know, Deus Vol, all that bullshit. Um, so you go on, you go on a crusade against uh, for Jerusalem, and you're like, right, we've got about equal numbers of Leve, my empire of, of Western Europe, versus the Abbasids. Let's duke it out. So your, your men at arms get off the boat uh, in I don't know Cyprus. Maybe maybe uh, you picked up Cyprus, or like you you own Sicily or something, right? And you send your guys on their boat, and the men at arms get off the boat, and they go to fight the Abbasids. And you absolutely slap them without even trying. Because your men-at-arms just walk all over their troops. Because that's what happens right now. If the AI was competent and actually built their lands up and put more of an emphasis on having a reasonable amount of men-at-arms with some half-decent buildings to support them both in tax and in stats, then the AI would be a credible threat. They just, they just need to have their weighting changed. They... They just need to focus more on getting some buildings up and keeping up with tech or the tech levels available to them than, you know, just hoarding 2,500 gold. That's probably not even the most egregious example. There's probably, I mean, this guy's got 1,000 gold in debt. Couldn't, he's making minus, he, he's at war with Sicily over something. He's got his minus 1,000 gold. He's got 99% war score. He probably can't finish that war because of some stupid dumb reason. Um, but this guy's got like four counties in central Italy. It's like, it's not like this guy is poor. Though if I were to look at the actual baronies themselves, they're probably not the most well built up baronies. So, you know, like he's getting a, a, a measly uh, 2.8 tax. Uh, plus... Plus one for being the realm capital. So his realm capital. Oh, this this duke is here with his realm capital there. Um, which uh, where's the king's realm capital? Uh, Spoleto is that your is that your capital? The the barony of Spoleto. Yeah, there you go. Realm capital. Realm capital of the kingdom of Romania. It makes a pittance.
3.4. The man's got, like, he's got 5,000 mercenaries out right now. He has, uh, thousands. So he's got, like, seven, not 8,000 levy, 5,000 mercenaries, that's like 13,000. He's got 2,000 men-at-arms. If I, if I go and look at just, like, 2,000 of my men-at-arms, right, now, like, these pikemen. So he's got some, he's got some siege weapons as well. So let's say we add these two together. That's six, six a month, Right. And that's when they're not raised. When they're raised, they're even more expensive. So let's go raise them just to get an idea of the, the the cost. Six gold a month for these guys and 12 for the pikemen. This man is going to need to make, the king of Spoleto needs to make like 18 gold a month to upkeep his levies, his men at arms. And then he had to pay for the mercenaries as well, which would have been really expensive at this stage of the game. So he needs to make about 18 gold a month. And his his realm capital makes three. Makes bet it doesn't even get it's not even halfway to making four gold a month, right? And he owns four counties. Can he support that army with four counties? No. That's why he's horribly in debt. Could he support that army with four counties? Yes. Yes, he could. Absolutely. I mean, admittedly, Kaslav does have a gold mine, but if I ignore that, right? Prague, 6.9 gold. Reasonably well developed. And that's on a hill. This isn't even a good province for taxes. Zatek, Farmland County. Reasonably well developed. This is only a level 4. This isn't even a level like higher than that. Level 4. Makes 7. 7 plus, you know, 8 plus 7. You know, we're already up to 15 gold, right? All right, let's, let's add in Litter Maurice, which isn't even particularly well built up. And it only has uh, 49 control. So it only has half its control. So it's only providing half its taxes. This would normally be providing eight. But let's just roll with it. I uh, say one of my provinces had a bad control event. And I only get half my taxes from it. That's still four. I'm now making 19 from three counties, right? Let's throw another county in there. I mean, this guy's in central Italy. This is a high-dev, high-tech area. So, you know, Rome, which does admittedly have some very, you know, well-boosted things, but um, most of its uh, ta tax bonuses are going from Grand Estates or the Grand Cathedral, which is in the area, right? Um, it, but, you know, it's, it's that's making 10. He he's in the the guys in Italy. Let's just take for example a um or uh, this this uh this isn't even a proper county. This is a barony. This is just a shitty little barony. It's only got one tax building, which is this forest uh, glassworks. Well, you, you know it's got it's got a thing that gives taxes, right? It makes four. So even with four and two of them are not even particularly you know great. Uh, provinces for income. I, I could support that army with four. It, you totally could. And this is in 1368. But the problem is, is, his land is atrocious. It's crap. Like, look at this. This is a this is a hills in Spoleto. He's got Hunter's Lodge that gives taxes. Hillside Fields gives taxes. Pastures gives taxes. If they were built up a little bit, yeah, he could totally support that army. You know, I don't know what else he owns. Um, County of Viterbo. Barony here. This is on plains, so it can, it could have. Um, it, he's he's actually built the castle up, so that's actually giving more defense. But you know, he's got two tax buildings there. This is actually a pretty well developed one, to be honest. Um, but you're starting to get the idea, right? There's there's no reason that the AI has to go broke. There's no reason. Um, they just need to actually focus on building their land up a little bit more. However, this all does come with a caveat. Of course it comes with a caveat. Because there's one, the biggest issue with CK3. Um, and it's, I, I don't know how you would fix it besides just changing the game. Say the AI, the king of uh, Danelaw. Decides to build up his land. He builds it up. You know, this is earlier on in the game. Let's assume this is like, say, uh, the AI, right, the, the, 
the king of East Francia, right at the start of the game, 867. He's quite old. He dies. The kingdom splits into Bavaria and into East Francia. They fight a bloody war over the kingdom. Now, this is right at the start of the game, so it's perfectly acceptable that this happens. And uh, the, king, the king of East Francia wins. He's 20 years old. He's reclaimed the kingdom of Bavaria. He's now a powerful king in, in Central Europe again. But he needs to build up his power base. So he does. He owns uh, four counties. Let's say he owns four counties. Because early on in the game, you can't have as many uh, domain holdings. So he's got four counties. He starts to build them all up. He puts... Uh, level 2 buildings in all of them, which is actually quite good for, you know, the early 8, 867 stages of the game. He gets level 2 tax buildings, um, he gets a couple level 2 levee buildings, this, this affords him a larger men-at-arms uh, pool. He he's done pretty well for himself. Uh, his tech's advancing, you know, his heir will be able to start building up his land to level 3, level 4. And then he dies. And he has to give three of those counties away to different heirs. He's now left with one county. Why does he have to give away that land to different heirs? Well, because at the start of the game in in uh, 867 and in 1066, because the other succession laws will not be available, you have to play with partition. And that is the that is the key issue with the AI not being a threat. You don't get primogeniture until the end of the game. And even if the AI flips into house seniority at heraldry, this is not accessed till what? 11 1150 or so at the 1100s or something. 867 uh, 1000 AD or 900 AD, and this is like a thousand or a thousand a hundred AD, and this is like 1200 AD, right? So, and most of the AI is probably not going to flip into how seniority, I don't think. Maybe they do, but either way, you see what I mean? There's a there's a vast section swath of the game where partition. Now, 1066 is probably more balanced. Don't get me wrong. 1066 is probably way more balanced, but the game gives you the option, and lots of people are going to do this. The game gives you the option to play in 867. It's like, oh, in EU4, you have the option of playing in 1444, right? You also have the option of playing in the in 1620, right? Most people are going to play in 1444 because it's the earliest start date. It's the beginning of the game. Sure, some people want to start halfway through, but beginning of the game, you want to start in the, the beginning of the game, right? Rise and fall of an empire, you know, it's more satisfying to play it right from the start. At least it is for me, and it probably is for most Paradox players as well. 1066 is like starting in 1620, right? Everything's going to be more developed, but it will be more developed artificially. Why is it developed artificially? Because there's no fucking way that the AI could make the map look anywhere as good as it is. Right, just, 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 just to point it out, right, right. Because Poland is all tribal land in the 867 start, now that it's been turned into not tribal land, we have counties, you know, this, is, this isn't that far into Poland, I took this over pretty early on. This is a county, the count hasn't freaking built anything there. It's, it's 1368, there's no buildings in this county, right? Do you want to do you wanna go, do we want to we go, I might as well, let's, let's go take a look at the 1066 start and take a look at that county and see how many buildings are there. Because I bet you there's going to be the barony, there's going to be a city and a temple, and there's going to be a ton of buildings there too. Is that balanced? Probably a hell of a lot more balanced than the 867 start. But why is it more balanced? Well, it's more balanced because... Now, I could get totally blown out of the water here, but I'm just assuming if I go 1066 and go um, uh, rags to riches... Oh, okay, that's for an achievement. Um, play as any ruler in 1066. Oh, they've got a new intro screen and stuff. That's that's fancy. Maybe you should fix the AI rather than the intro. Um, yeah, let's go. Let's go look at Poland, shall we? This is this, this province here. We're gonna go play as this guy, Count 
the claw of Chisk. Um, I probably said that wrong, but anyway. Gostinin. 1066. It's not tribal, right? So they've already non-tribalized it. It has one building, but it also has a temple. Now, temples cost, uh, well, holdings cost like 800 gold, right? So you're telling me, in 300 years, the Count of Gostinin has not been able to make 300 gold. Or build up a single building. A single building in like 300 years since becoming feudal. And that, that's just one example. I mean, I could go over my entire game and pull out provinces that are underdeveloped. I mean, look, you know, there were some level, there were some provinces, there were some baronies in Germany that were like, they had two in every building. Um, it's most egregious in, in like the areas that like, like Novgorod, where these will be, um, I mean, these aren't quite so bad because, you know, they haven't actually built up the uh, other holdings either, but you know, it, it's sad, really, because you look at the, you look at these provinces like Novgorod. Novgorod itself, it, this was a, a merchant capital of the medieval world. It's got two baronies. That's it. Two baronies. It will never have anything else. I, and I can say that with certainty. The AI will never, never build one of these holdings up. They just won't. They will never invest 800 gold to do that, or 600 gold, how much it costs. They won't do it. Novgorod will never be a powerful merchant capital of the medieval period in, in, in Russia. It will never be some splendor, a splendid city. Um, but it, the AI just doesn't know how to do it. The AI just doesn't know how to do it. I mean, we look at Venice. I mean, Venice in 1066, I mean, come on, man. This is this is atrocious. Venice wasn't a shithole in 1066, at least as far as I'm aware. In fact, most of Italy was was doing all right because this was like the, you know, the heartland of the Roman Empire was one of the few places that wasn't completely ruined. You know, I mean, you know, we, we take take a look at Constantinople. These are all level one buildings. This is barely le this is this is pro barely or probably even not even as good as the ten as the 867 start. It's like in the time period between 867 and 1066, very little has changed. I mean, at least with the AI, that makes sense. Because, you know, between 867 and 1066, the AI probably hasn't changed in 200 years. They probably haven't built anything in the uh, capital of Byzantium. But you, I know I know this is like scathing, but it's true. It, it's true. The, the AI just doesn't know how to work the economy of the game. And like, how... How could Paradox have played this and went, yeah, that's fine. AI is worth it working perfectly as intended. And I'll tell you why that they thought the AI was perfectly as intended. And again, this is, as I said, beta testing games and just, you know, understanding how to check if a game works. In-house, they, they have an idea of how the game should work. Oh, people are supposed to play a king. I'm playing... The Count of Vaklor of Chesk. He is a he is a temperate man, but he's lazy and uh, but he's generous. So he's temperate. He's generous. He's a he's a good negotiator. He's going to become friends with various different people in the kingdom. He's going to ra raise a, a a good Christian family. You know, he's he's virtuous, but he's lazy. He has he he lacks ambition. He why would he go about conquering more land? Perhaps one of his sons, his son who is who's rowdy. Perhaps perhaps his son, Wincenty, Winchen Wincenty. I don't really know how you'd say that name, but maybe his son will become ambitious, and then he will conquer more land in the name of the family, right? But they're really role playing the characters, right? And and so f and they probably don't even play till the end of the game anyway. They play for like a hundred years and then go, or they play for one character and go, oh that was fun, and then they stop, right? But if you really like had someone on the testing team who went, all right, let's let's push the game, let's 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 play, let's get as far as I can during the beta testing, right? Regardless of bugs and stuff, and really like try to exploit the crap out of everything, you know? Like, and here's the thing: things like the North Korea strategy. It's not like these weren't known about in CK2. If they wanted to stop them, they could have. They could have put in um, uh, fail-safes 
for that kind of thing. Like those those glitches and exploits were known in the previous title. So it makes me feel like they either just didn't bother or they didn't know about them, which means that they weren't paying attention to the to the uh, understanding of the game that the players built up over the years. But yeah, like they would have had. I don't think they had anybody in house who actually tried to really game the system. They didn't try to be gamey. Is it fun to be gamey in a game like CK3? Some people are going to find it fun. Well, actually, the people who would find it fun are going to find it disappointing because the AI is not a challenge, right? And. If the AI was more gamey, well, it's not gamey. It's not gamey that the AI builds up their land and is actually somewhat competent at managing their armies, you know? It would make the map actually look a lot more contextually accurate, you know? The medieval era wasn't full of backwater f castles. Like, oh, the temples and the cities are incredibly well developed, but the castles themselves, oh no, oh no. They're just like some mud ditch with some some half-starved peasants that the Lord kicks around and throws into combat you know, meaninglessly. That's absolutely not what the feudal era was like. Once you get into the, you know, we were in 1368 and a lot of the castles were still you know, barely a, a modern bailey. You know, you had these magnificent grand architectural marvels that required vast amounts of wealth and power and influence to be able to build and they attracted massive you know uh places to field armies they could hold you know some sieges in the medieval period lasted for literally years because the forts were that well advanced You'd have to siege them, and these were people who were sieging them that had access to siege weapons and advanced siege tactics, and they would have to try to starve the defenders out and assault the castle, you know, piece after piece, for, for years to break through, because they were that well designed. And the economies and the, sub, the subjects that were built around them, you know, they became... Uh, a large castle, a place of defense, and you know, awe-inspiring, you know, design like that that attracts people to it. You know, there would have been um, uh, artists, uh, merchants, uh, artisans, uh, all sorts of you know, the 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 middle class of, or, or the, even the wealthier, more affluent individuals of the medieval world. They would have been drawn to the the castles not just the cities not just the temples yes the temples were rich but they were rich because of donations and land right which is which is represented in the game in that the uh the temples themselves they have a decent amount of money and they're they're quite uh well developed like land itself is because the temple would would uh take the land holdings that they owned and they would they would own the farmers on them and stuff but um, and, and the cities themselves were like the the centers of of commerce and and scientific in, innovation and such. So the cities being developed makes a lot of sense as well. You know, the longer the cities are at peace, um, and you know, the, they are at peace most of the time because it, they're not going to get raided. I mean, when raiding happens, sure, it is it is a problem, but. The cities bounce back from it because the AI's got nothing better to do than build them up. Because there's no mechanics for theocracies or republics right now. So as far as the AI is concerned, they don't have anything to do except build up the city. But the lords have got lots of things they need to do. But they shouldn't neglect the most important thing they should be doing, which is having a stable and prosperous kingdom to, to just pursue wars all the time or, or go on feasts and do RP events and things like they, they, you know they need to be competent and yeah as I was saying you know part of that issue is partition part of it is just the way that the AI waits its decision making how do you fix it well honestly I would just let the AI the AI seems to be quite good at trying to dodge succession crises like they'll deliberately set laws and and elective laws in place so that the things don't pass outside their house or their realm so the AI clearly understands how the laws of succession work 
could we please, could we please just be able to switch to primogeniture based on crown authority? The AI seems way more happy to make um, factions that will reduce your crown authority than in previous titles, in CK2 being the previous title. Um, the AI is way more likely to create factions to kick you down a notch on crown authority. And if you had to get all the way to absolute crown authority to set primogeniture, or it says high, so if you, you had to go all the way to high to get primogeniture, how is that not balanced? Why why does it have to be locked behind a technology as well? Why why does it also have to be locked behind a a, a tech that's you know oh you don't have it till the twelve hundreds and that doesn't even historically make sense. Oh the the king the king dies and then he passes the title of king to his son. Yeah, that happens in partition as well, but he just gives away all of his other holdings. And do you know what kings actually did? This is a this is a pretty this is going to be a bit more culturally associated with me being from England, but England had a incredibly rich um, church culture with you know church architecture and you know lots of monasteries and churches. Do you do you know why that is? Because when a English or a, a Saxon, I should say Saxon, because at the time they were the Saxons. Uh, wh why, why did the Saxons build so many cast, uh, uh, temples and monasteries and things? Uh, the Anglo-Saxons, once they were all Christianized and such. Because if they had a son that, they, that was second in line, they would expect land. What do they do? They build a church and they give it to their son, because their son then becomes the bishop of that church and he owns the land around it. So he'd just build a church and give it to him, um, and then all of the main titles would go to the to the main heir who's supposed to be king, and then he would build churches for his sons. When the Normans came along and they went, wait a second, why why are all these churches here? They're they're all owned by the Saxon lords. They're not owned by the church. Normans came in, turfed out the Saxons, and. Um, they were like, oh, well, we'll just give it to the church. It's all church land now. And the church didn't know what to do with it, so they just they kind of handed it back out amongst... Well, rather, the Normans passed out the churches to their their lords and things, and the lords went, oh, I don't know what to do with it. So what did they do with it? They gave it to their sons, and they just passed it on again. Um, so it all became church land once more. Um, until, of course, the absolute... Uh, abolish... Uh, the, uh, the uh, oh, I can't remember the name for it. The ab, ab not the abolition, the absolution. Is it the absolution? Absolution of the monasteries act that King um, Henry the Eighth did to he cut all the monasteries apart and stole their gold. Either way, um, I'm not a massive history buff uh, at that time period. I'm I prefer my Dark Ages and stuff. But either way, there were. There should be mechanics to do that. And if you've watched me play uh, when I was playing as Pagan, I was handing out the most obscene amount of territory to some of my heirs, and it would still give them all of the counties that I wanted to keep. I conquered n entire duchies worth of land just to give to my heirs. And guess what? They still wanted half of the counties in my main uh, area. Why? Because I was an emperor. And so they des they demand at least a kingdom title, else they're going to take literally everything they can to make up the fact that they won't get a kingdom title. It was actually ridiculous how much land. Honestly, I passed out like eight counties to some of them. Oh, guess what? They can't hold eight counties because of the domain holding limit, so they're going to pass some of those counties away. All right, I'll make you into a duke so that those can be direct vassals of yours. Yes, but I personally don't own enough duchy titles. Do you mind going to conquer me another two duchy titles so I don't take all of your freaking counties from you? It, partition is what ha hamstrings the AI. I I'm telling you right now, if you would... And other mods have done it. Other mods have done it. Um, the Bronze Age mod, in the literal earliest era of the Bronze Age mod, there is a tech called Kingship, and it enables primogeniture. 
right in the very first technological era of the Bronze Age mod. Why? Because the idea of kingship and passing your land to your son was something that they came up with in the Bronze Age. To just let it sink in how ridiculous it is that all of Europe has to be partitioned constantly for the next 400 years from 867 to 1250, right? That you have to constantly partition your land off. And it just makes the AI worse. It makes succession a ball ache for, like, no reason. Like, wh why? Okay, why not give me the option? And, yeah, sure, you can actually, you can have monasticism, right? Catholicism has monasticism. C courtiers can take vows and become a monk. Yeah, well, I could also go to my heir here and go, yo, I, I want him to take the vows, right? Rather than disinherit. I know you can disinherit him, but I could ask him to take the vows. Will not accept. Why? Second in line for your primary title. So I can't make him a monk. Right? Because he's second in line for my primary title. If I make a church, it immediately gets given out to, lo and behold, Mr. Suffragan Bishop here, who controls all of the all of the temple holdings in our land. That's not actually how the church has functioned. But that's okay, we'll probably get some more you know, functionality to the uh, to the theocratic elements of the game when they release a DLC that handles theocracies, or at least expands how temples work. So, wh what do I do? I make a barony, and I give it to my second-in-line son. Well, too bad. Um, I have partition. Which means that he's going to expect a county, because the highest title available to him is county. So I'm still going to, even if I build a barony and give it to one of my sons... He's going to want additional land. Uh, do you know why Gavelkind wasn't such of a ball ache in the previous um, CK2? I mean, it was still a ball ache, but why Gavelkind and Partition wasn't so bad in CK2? As long as your son was landed, it wasn't a problem. As long as you gave him some land, because that's all they asked for. They just wanted some land. That was the law. The law of the realm is that all of your sons must be landed, and upon the family the head of the house dying his lands will be split amongst his sons yeah his unlanded sons if his sons are landed then it doesn't count them in the succession because they already have a title in ck3 that's not the case in ck3 if your sons are landed but not with the highest possible title underneath your current one they will just gob they will just steal everything except the just a line, a single line of one title, emperor, one ki one emperorship, one kingdom, one duchy, and one county. That's it. They'll let you keep that. They'll let you keep that. But everything else, the other seven counties you owned, the other duchy title you had, the other kingdom title you had, nah, those get taken away from you if you have too many heirs. And I guess, yeah, some people will go, have less heirs. Which is a ridiculous notion, because we're in the medieval period. So, the, the one answer to the, the problem is a ridiculous one. So, yeah, just, take, just, just, just get rid of the whole laws are, are locked behind freaking... Get, just get rid of it. That, that would solve... The, the AI would be ten times more functional. I can guarantee you that. I can, I can guarantee you the kingdoms and the empires would be... Ten times more functional if they were just allowed to pick primogeniture. I mean, the Byzantine Empire sometimes has some civil wars. But the actual title of the Byzantine Empire never falls apart. Why? It's locked at primogeniture at the start of the game. The Seljuks. Same thing. Guy's got primogeniture. Am I, if I were to play this, would I see the Seljuks fall apart? Maybe to a civil war, or an independence war, but not, not to succession. Seljuks are always going to be there, and the head of the Seljuks, the, the, the ruler of the Seljuk uh, Empire, he's always going to be a powerful man, because all of these titles are going to get passed to his heir. Look, he gets all these claims. Implicit claim for primogeniture, this guy. 
He's going to get all of them. He's going to be powerful. And then his heir, he's going to be powerful. Because he's an emperor. Don't take this as me being angry. I'm trying to give some sort of constructive criticism of how we can make the game better. Or fix elements of the game that would make the AI more challenging. And it would make the AI develop better over the course of a longer game. As opposed to a short game where the AI is just like, if you're only playing for the lifetime of one character, fair enough. Then this doesn't apply to you. If you're only playing for the the, the, the lifetime of your main character and his main heir, fair enough. Doesn't apply to you. But if you want to play all the way from 867 to 1421, if you are in any way expanding and are somewhat competent at paradox like you don't have to be the best player ever you just you, you don't even have to be particularly quick you can be hella slow and you'll probably still end up with three empire titles and guess what you'll be able to walk over absolutely any ai in the game because they won't be able to fight your men at arms stacks and those are with totally into as i said totally intentional as is in the game mechanics So again, it does feel like they didn't have anyone in-house in, in Paradox's testing studio. They didn't have anyone in-house actually trying to game the system. They didn't have anyone playing it as a game primarily. As a map painting simulator. As, as a, you know, as a conquesting. They were playing it as, like, it's almost like all the beta testers were like, Oh, I'm gonna, we're all gonna roleplay as different characters. Oh, isn't this fun? Yeah, it is fun. Don't get me wrong, it is fun. I love it. You know, the CK3 is good for that. It's going to get more options for that once they release DLC, because that's how they're going to sell DLC, because that's what people enjoy. But for the for the map painting, for the for the tactical wargaming aspect, because this is a war game at the end of the day, you know, war is an integral part of the time period and the game mechanics. As a war game, it completely breaks down once you get later into the, the game absolutely and utterly breaks down so there you have it and and it feels like that was just completely missed because of beta testing and you know this video is probably gonna get lost to the annals of youtube i mean uh, there's been quite a lot of people who've actually watched the uh ck3 world conquest videos already and i'm very i'm very happy that you have guys and i i'm sorry that this is coming out a bit late as i said i've, I've been busy and you know this is a long video i've had to really collate my thoughts about it and i had some busy weekends when i was gonna upload it and you know the boldest gate 3 came out and it, i was doing some stuff for the uh, ambanar people as well um because that's another mod that i'm very you know focused on doing content for these days um and i've been waiting for Baldur's gate 3 for ages uh, i won't talk about Baldur's gate 3 too uh too much because if you've seen me stream it then oh boy you already know what i think about that and you can probably tell by my exasperated tone that not good <laughs> um i was thinking about doing some videos on bg3 so I, I you may see that on the channel at some point but we'll see if i can grin and bear it anyway enough of that ck3 so yeah, apologies for everyone that has been following it. I know I've read, I have read the comments. I know that you guys have enjoyed it, um, and I, I am very thankful that you watched it. Uh, the whether you watched the full World Conquest or you just saw parts of it, um, I know they're incredibly long videos. I know some of you said cut them down. I know this is going to be quite a long video as well. I know some of you said cut them down, but I'm going to be honest, guys. It takes me three times as long to stream eight hours right and i do long streams i stream six seven eight hours right then i when i go and edit it and i cut even just half an hour out it takes an hour or two to cut that 30 minutes out right because of the the, the quality that i process the videos at whilst i'm doing that i can't really do much else on my pc i could process like maybe two two three videos at a time and then I have to, and then once they're done, I have to upload them and they take about an hour to upload. So in the time it takes me to cut up two hours of footage and upload them to YouTube, I could have streamed for eight hours. And it's like, well, you could just, 
I can't stream and do the videos at the same time because that really screws with the my memory on my PC and my, my CPU and processing power on that. Because I, I do the when I have cut videos up and I have processed them, I process them at a, pre, uh, a reasonably high quality, you know, 1080p and, and a decent audio bitrate and that sort of thing. And and it does take a very long time. Like I processed the last episode of this series. I had to cut the ending out because I played a copyright song for more than three minutes. So YouTube would have just like completely shut off the entire video. So I did have to process that and it took me eight, I had to leave my PC on for almost two days to process eight hours worth of content and upload it. And you can't upload YouTube videos over the midnight mark. Because if, you, if you're uploading something and, and the system clock changes from one day to the next, it corrupts the upload. So for particularly long uploads, I, I have to spend a day doing that. And I know my uploads are long, so I do have to spend a day doing that. Uh, which means I can't um, do streams. And I like doing streams because I, I can interact with people whilst I'm doing the stream. Um, which is really fun. Um... I do still want to put videos up on YouTube when I can, but they are going to be just VOD dumps because it saves me a lot of time doing that. Downloading an eight hour stream from Twitch only takes like an hour and then uploading it. Uh, sure, it takes like four hours or something, but that's a lot more preferable than cutting the eight hours up into 30, mon 30 minute chunks and then trying to upload all of them at a reasonable pace because that could take me two days, two, three days. And I can't be streaming and getting more content done whilst if I if I want to get that done at a uh, reasonably quick pace. So I know it comes in batches and I know it's not the most regular thing in the world. But, you know, if my videos aren't regular, but I'm uploading 40 hours worth of content when I do upload them, hopefully that should keep you guys entertained for the time being. <laughs> Uh, but do let me know, of course, if there's any particular thing, as always, that you'd like to see on the channel, whether it be a game or or, or just a, qu a question or, or uh, me chatting about something to do with gaming. I mean, this is a gaming channel, so, you know, if it's gaming, it's gaming. I'll, I'll cover it. Uh, but do let me know. Otherwise, just come to the streams. Um, it's in the About section of the YouTube. You can find my Twitch channel um, as I said, I streamed all of CK3. This this video itself is not streamed because I'm just talking about my thoughts about CK3 and the game in general. Um, but I, I stream everything. I've been as I said, I've been streaming Baldur's Gate 3 recently. I'm going to be streaming some more EU4. Um, uh, as of this video going up, you'll I'll be streaming a fair bit more EU4. Um, I really want to find another title I can like focus on and get some good content for. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that's going to be. Uh, probably not Cyberpunk, for those of you that, that immediately springs to mind. Probably not that, but I was hoping I could get some really good quality content from BG3, honestly. But um, I might I might have to do a video or two on that because it... it I don't want to be the pariah of YouTube because or, or even Twitch because I know loads of people are, are bumming the crap out of bg3 but there are some serious issues with that game like some really serious ones and i don't want to talk about them right now because this is not really what the purpose of this video is for but i am letting you guys know if there is anything you want me to cover specifically do let me know because i i am open to ideas i'm very very open to ideas um even if it's like you know even if it's something i've already played before in the past or or recently you know if, you, if there's a particular thing you want to see about crusader kings 3 I'm I'm down to play some more games of CK3. I just won't be doing any more World Conquests because I really don't see the point. It's not like I even got an achievement or anything. I played the whole thing on Iron Man. I didn't even get an achievement, <laughs> which does feel a bit bad. Um, wish they'd add that achievement into the game so I could go. I could get that, but never mind. Um, anyway, I I think that's about all I wanted to cover. So I know I've rambled a lot. It's hard to collate my, you know, it's hard to collate two hours or almost three hours of advice, thoughts, criticisms, fixes into like a coherent string without me going off on some tangent about something that just comes to mind, which 
I'm sure some of you guys will probably find infuriating. Um, but, it, you know, I've tried to cover as much as I can. And there is a lot to cover. Or else it wouldn't be three hours long. But hopefully it's been helpful. I mean, if you only watch like the first hour or so, then you won't hear this. But yeah, uh, you can see that there's different parts of the video that might be useful for different people. Um, yeah, All right. Hopefully it was all useful for you. Um, please comment away. If you think I'm talking shit, also comment away. Because you know, if if people don't have discussions about this sort of thing, then the game won't get better. And honestly, whenever I sound disappointed or frustrated or angry at a game that I'm playing, it almost always means that I want the game to be a lot better. Because I wouldn't care. It, if I don't care about something, I don't cover it. You know? I, I I wouldn't bother putting the time in to make a video about it. But I do care, which is why I want to see it get better. So I put a lot of time and effort. This is, it's, it's really the reason why I want to make a series about uh, BG3, really. Um, because, you know, if, if it's a video game that I enjoy uh, and I play regularly, then... It's something I put time and effort into, and uh, that that means I will sometimes I will get crit critical of it, and and so, sometimes my criticism does get quite scathing about these things. But I I I can't. It's not like I can I can just say everything is fine. It's all dandy, you know. Because some people will watch this. Or watch some of my other series and use it use it as a benchmark whether they should buy the game or not. I don't want people to waste their money if if they wouldn't really enjoy the game. So I have I and you know there's going to be people who don't have as much free time as me to who they want to do a Crusader Kings three World Conquest but they don't have as much time as me. So by putting a video like this up, I can talk about some of the um, you know, it, it's going to be a long video, but spend three hours watching this video and save yourself 20 plus hours, 40, I, I mean, I play speed five a lot. Other people can't do that or they don't have as good a PC. They might spend 40 hours playing a CK3 World Conquest. And my advice is don't because it's not fun and you won't enjoy it. And the AI is not challenging enough and it's really just not worth your time. And if people don't hear that, if people, if I, if I just go, yeah, CK3 is great, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the, the World Conquest was an amazing achievement, wow, poggers, like, and then people go, oh, wow, I'm going to go do a, a World Conquest, and then 20 hours into the game, and they're just like, well, I'm this far, but now I have to waste another 20 hours of my life, which is a lot of time, you know, a lot of time, and they're just not going to enjoy it, then that's, that's not good, and I haven't done my job, you know, I haven't, well, it's not a job, but, yeah, I haven't done. I haven't fulfilled my role as a content creator. You see, at least that's the way I see it, anyway. Um, so I like to give honest feedback, criticisms, opinions about the things that I enjoy, and it's because I enjoy them that I give honest criticisms and opinions. It. It's not like I'm making some fake advert for Raid Shadow Legends or something and pretending like it's a great game, right? I've never played it, by the way, but, you know, you can just tell, can't you? It's a piece of mobile trash. But, it... <laughs> there you go, free publicity for Raid Shadow Legends there. Um, but, you, you, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to dupe people. I'm not trying to... I'm not getting paid to do this. So, and, and also, yeah, for, for, for you guys, like... I, I, I don't get paid ad revenue on YouTube or anything to do these videos, to play 30 hours of CK3 or whatever. Um, I just do it because it's fun. Um, if you, like, do enjoy the stuff enough and you really, really, really want to support me doing more of this kind of stuff, I mean, you can actually subscribe to me on Twitch because I am an affiliate of Twitch. They gave me affiliate status. I 
couldn't tell you why, but they did. <laughs> um, so if you really want to support me, you can jump on there and drop a subscribe or, or you know, if you've got Amazon Prime, I'm sure people have told you this before, but if you've got Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to people for free and then you basically are sending me Amazon's money, not your money. Like if you've got Amazon Prime, you get the sub one subscription a month for free. So you could just send me Amazon's cash, which is really cool. And it's not much, like don't get me wrong. It's not like it's uh, it's going to suddenly um, change my life. But, <laughs> uh, but it is really appreciated, you know, everyone that's subscribed so far. Um, whether it's, you know, people subscribing on Twitch for money or if it's just people subscribing on YouTube because they like the content, you know, it it is, it's really, it's, it's helpful. It's helpful. It lets me know that, you know, making these videos, I mean, primarily is for my own enjoyment, but, you know, if other people get a kick out of it, then you know, it feels good, man. So, and if I can help people, you know, get better at the game or enjoy the game more or, you know, make a decision about whether to purchase the game um, because certain elements of the game they're not sure about. And I like to pride myself on having a fairly high level of quality of gameplay as opposed to, like... Because, you know, I don't want people to get duped into buying a game because they see, so like, you know, they see someone playing it and they're just playing it, like really me me and they go and you know someone who might want to play the game more seriously thinks themselves well i didn't get quite a perfect impression of how the gameplay works but i'll give it a shot anyway and then they end up playing it and, it, and they really don't enjoy it then it's not a fault of the person that they watched but i want to give people that experience uh, of having someone to watch that you know, don't want to blow my own horn. I did a world conquest. I clearly know what I'm doing with CK3, right? So, and I do focus on the gameplay mechanics. You know, not not the role play. I don't. I don't. You know, the, sometimes I'll I'll role play a bit, but if I was doing a role play game, I would that would be the focus of the game, not the mechanics. Because I was doing a world conquest, the clear focus is the mechanics of the game. And I wanted to showcase that. Hopefully I did a good enough job of that for you guys. And now my my summary opinion, which you know I've said more than once now, is um is that it's not worth your time. Crusader Kings 3 is worth your time. Crusader Kings 3 is a good game. But if you want to play Crusader Kings 3, uh to do a world conquest say that you've always thought about doing a world conquest but you were never sure about it it's not fun don't bother the, the game does not support a world conquest it, you don't even get an achievement for it <laughs> you get bragging rights i have a save file i can now load up and point at people and go look i've finished a world conquest no cheats it's on iron man you know um it is what it is but that's it it's it's it's, bra it's bragging rights that that's all it is I, I personally want to do it because I feel a, a, a personal sense of satisfaction for having finished it. Um, but for those of you that are more casual players or players who are like, I've never done a World Conquest, should I do one of CK3? It's not that difficult, but it's also not very rewarding. Um, so I would recommend if you play CK3 and you... Uh, sure, you can add your own challenge to the run. You can do that. But if you really want to push the uh, the game to its limits... You're not going to find it very hard. Um, if you are going to play CK3, play it for the roleplay aspects. Play it for uh, building a great dynasty of, of Chadley giant geniuses, right? Um, go and sleep with the, the king of Novgorod as some, I don't know, 17-year-old Mongolian uh, twink down in the kingdom of Koch or whatever, I don't know. Go abduct the the Duke of Glasgow and uh, castrate him and sell him back to his family. You know, just have fun doing the wacky, dumb shit that CK3 is good for. Because that's what CK3 is good for. It's good for the fun, stupid, absurd things that are represented in the game. 
yeah, as and and the the mechanics of the warfare hold up decently for the first half of the game which to be quite frank most people never finish a game of paradox they don't play till the end date because it becomes a slog it happens in all of their games uh, they just haven't cracked the formula yet i'm sure they will at some point but they just haven't done it yet right how i would go about cracking that formula honestly i'm not even sure um i'd have to think about it but as far as cracking the formula of making the AI a little bit more competent, got to change the per the weighting on decision making to make them more economically focused. You need to change the personalities so they know how to spend their money and build up their their nation more. And you need to make partition less shit. You need to make it so that the AI can actually get the other succession forms at a reasonable pace. Otherwise, they're too weak for too long. And if they're too weak for too long, they never build up. If they never build up, then they're never a threat. And and none of the countries are a threat because it's just your stack of men at arms versus their blob of levy that don't do anything. Um, even in the you know the late 1300s. I wasn't fight. I wasn't seeing anyone that could even come close, comparably close, to how powerful that we were. You know, in the, when the World Conquest got into full swing, it was like in the 1250s. I'd managed to snag primogeniture early from the Byzantine Empire getting inherited by me, which honestly I don't know how that happened, but um, at least I don't know how I got primogeniture out of it. Because it made all of my titles primogeniture, which is maybe it was a weird bug. I don't know, but I had I had house seniority, so I I deliberately played as the check so I could get house seniority early, so I could try to avoid some of the partition bullshit. But honestly, just building baronies lets you avoid that. But the AI won't do that, so the the AI needs a band aid, and the band aid is allowing them to take partition or or anything but partition early on in the game, you know. That that is the band aid. That that's how you fit. That's how you make the, all everything about CK three work smoother. Some people love partition, but honestly, if you take a hard look at the mechanics of the game and how the AI functions, it doesn't function very well. And it that is the main cause of it. It's the main cause of the instability within empires, uh, factions being formed out of freaking nowhere. Um, bankruptcy spirals with and them having to delete their men at arms only to ha then have to rebuild them later on uh, it's it's all to do with partition and them losing their power bases constantly and then never have it and never having the the sense to build up one because they don't know how to because it was clearly not designed into them to function that way so there you go that is in summary the three hour summary of CK3, it's broken stuff. It's actually broken stuff, not what people call broken little meme -y video. That, that is what I've done is actually how you do a, a world conquest, right? You know, if you follow the meme videos of, of other people saying this is OP, and yes, the North Korea strategy is OP. Don't get me wrong, but you don't need to do it to do a world conquest. So if you want to do a world conquest without using exploits like that, go ahead. And the other OP strat, quote unquote, OP strategies, um, golden obligations, uh, divorce glitching, uh, those sorts of uh, uh, abducting uh, stuff. I think that's mostly been fixed up now. Um, they're not actually what's intrinsically broken about the game as i've stated the intrinsically broken stuff is i've covered i'm not going to talk about it anymore um but in case you didn't know now now you know what the busted ass stuff is and, and or or it's given you a perspective because you may have known about like the teleporting units thing everyone knows about the teleporting units thing right but when you're just teleporting from one side of your kingdom you know one side of england to the other doesn't seem that broken when you're teleporting when you're fighting a war in Mongolia, and then you're fighting a war in southern India, and then you're fighting a war in Egypt, right, back to back, you're going Mongolia, fight, win, India, fight, win, Egypt, fight, win, Africa, fight, win, right? When you're, when you're doing that, you realize how busted it is, right? So there you go. Anyway, we're going to be just under the three-hour mark. 
thank you all for watching up to this point. If not, um, maybe on some psychic level you'll understand my thanks for at least clicking the video open and watching a short part of it. I hope this answers any questions that you have about CK3. If you do have some questions, of course, please put them in the comments. I'll try to get to them as soon as I can. And if you want to see more content on a more regular basis, please check the uh, About section of the YouTube. There is a link. There is a permanent link to the Discord in there where you can ask me questions directly. There is a permanent link to my Twitch channel. Please follow that if you want to see live content. I don't like asking for follows and I absolutely am not going to ask for subscribes and things like that because that is on your own volition. If you wanted to subscribe, you've probably already done it. <laughs> if you wanted to follow, you've probably already done it. But some people don't know that I, I also work, uh, I also do things on Twitch. I do try to mention it regularly so that people know because that is where I do my live things. And I also try to mention the Discord because that is an easy way to get in contact with me on a real term basis, you know. Which can be helpful for people that want to ask questions, because I, I don't necessarily check YouTube as regularly as I used to, given that I don't upload videos to YouTube as regularly. Um, but yes, if you if you do want to, you know, check my live content, then Twitch is the place to go. Okay. All right, guys, it's been me, Chaff Commander Coffee. Thank you all for watching up to this point, or whatever point you did. I wish you well. Good luck in whatever runs you happen to be doing on CK3. May your heirs be geniuses and your successions short, swift, and uncomplicated. And for the future, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to be doing as my next series. Possibly something to do with EU4, probably something to do with EU4, so expect some more Paradox titles in future, but if you have any suggestions for things you want to see, uh, things that I've played in the past, things that you think I would like, or just general suggestions from things that you've heard me mention on stream or on the channel beforehand, please do let me know. It's all helpful to know what people want to watch, because I, I, you know, anything that I've played or, you know, could check out, I'm probably going to enjoy. You know, video gaming is great after all um, especially in these dark times and uh, yes do stay safe everyone I will see you again when I see you have a good one and until next time goodbye